Hello and welcome to A Review to a Kill, the James Bond retrospective podcast where we rewatch every Bond from Connery to Craig to review and rank each one. I'm your host, Special Agent Sedgwick, and returning for this debrief is an agent whose reflexes are quick enough to keep up with the editing in the last mission. <laughs> Carter, Chris Carter. You know, for an old man, my reflexes are pretty sharp. I blame that on video games. Today, we are reviewing Skyfall, the 23rd Bond outing from Eon Productions, the most financially successful Bond film of all time. Really? Followed by Spectre and then No Time to Die, and the 30th most successful film ever, period. Wow. The first Bond movie to make over a billion dollars in the box office before inflation. This movie was beyond popular and brought Bond completely out of niche fandom and into mainstream must-see franchise for every generation. It was also the first screened on IMAX. Oh, really? I really enjoyed this movie. The first time I watched this movie, I didn't like it. And I gotta be honest, I don't know why. On a second rewatch, I can't tell you why I didn't like it. But after rewatching it, I gotta say, this is... They stepped their game up like almost every movie. The film premiered at the Royal Albert Hall on the 23rd of October, 2012, with Prince Charles and that homewrecker Camilla in attendance. (laughs) <laughs> Reception for the film was overwhelmingly positive. Everything from the song, the visuals, the locales, the performances, and story were praised. Retrospective reviews have been much of the same, with some complaining of the length and third act pacing, along with the convolution of Silva's plan. Those were some of my complaints when I first watched this movie. And then on the rewatch, I was like, eh, is it so bad? Is his plan actually that convoluted? Like, the more I thought about it? It's really not. There's one thing that I feel like we could say about. Yeah, there's one thing, but it's, yeah, it's pretty solid. It's all right. Made for $150 million, it made $1.11 billion in the box office, with a B. The film was nommed for five Academy Awards, winning two, one of which was for Adele's song, making it the only Oscar-winning Bond song. The film was nominated for Golden Globes and so many other awards that there's an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to just this film's accolades. That's uh, pretty impressive. Pre-production started quickly after Quantum of Solace in 2009, but was suspended with the MGM bankruptcy. When MGM crawled out of it in December 2010, production resumed. The movie was released in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the franchise. Produced by Babs Brock and Mike Wilson. Daniel Craig returning. Again, no gun barrel sequence to start, instead opting for a new artistic take. We open on a blurry hallway backlit from a window. The first major chords of the Bond theme hit, and Bond's blurry silhouette steps out in sync to center frame. I love these new takes, after often just pasting the same gun barrel for multiple films. I do too. This whole opening scene, from the start of this scene where he's silhouetted in the doorway to the point where he walks out to the jeep, is a magical scene. I had to watch it twice to make sure it wasn't one take. It's so well paced and shot. Bond walks towards the camera. There's a quiet, unnerving, slow drag of strings as he comes into focus and just enough light to reveal half his face. He hears a noise and raises his firearm before approaching a room at the end of the hall. Inside the rooms, he finds two dead agents and one dying one. Bond reports into his earpiece and him asks if what he's looking for is there. Bond sees the laptop ripped open, saying, Hard drive's gone. They must have it. Get after them. Bond tries to stop the bleeding of the dying agent, and M says, Fuck that guy, go get the movie started. (laughs) I like this moment of character growth for Bond, because, like, young Bond would have fucked that guy and moved on. Old Bond is like, I'm gonna try to help this dude. Like, I'm tired of people dying around me. Old Bond carries this guy's death. He asks about him later. He left him to die. It's a great moment that quickly and subtly pays tribute to his growth over the last two films. Bond doesn't want to leave this man to die, but he has to. So he exits the building and out onto a Minonu Square, Istanbul. He jumps into a 2007 Land Rover Defender with a woman driving. And this is Eve, played by Naomi Harris. Loved her in 28 Days Later. I love her in everything. Naomi mean, Harris is kind of a hottie. Bond asks the woman if she made their target, and she responds that the target's in the black Audi. Which, after God knows how long from him leaving, he's literally right in front of them. The one cheap Bond trope even Craig couldn't kill. (laughs) Tanner tells Bond that the medical evac for the downed agent is five minutes away, but that guy was shot in the heart. Yeah, he was dying. Money Penny, uh, I mean Eve, knocks a side mirror (laughs) off, and Bond quips, that's alright, you aren't using it. Which was clever. 
But then she clips off the other and snarks that she wasn't using that one either. Which wasn't clever, even if Bond smirks at it. No, no. A little over the top? It was almost done on purpose because they honestly eviscerate this girl in the beginning to show that she's not capable of being in the field. Even her one-liners fucking suck. They're cheesy and terrible. Oh, yeah. They knock around the Turkish market with the 2007 Audi A5, and Bond locks eyes with this target. He then grabs the wheel and hard jerks it into the Audi, causing it to crash. Bond jumps out of the Defender as the assailant fires an SMG from his window at them. Did I say SMG? I'm sorry. When he gets out, he reveals it's an automatic pistol with a double drum clip. Jesus, no wonder I thought that was a Mac 10. <laughs> Gangbangers are using that shit in the hood, dude. The assailant, named Patrice, is played by Ola Rapace, Numi Rapace's far less famous husband. Far less famous, because I do know who Numi Rapace is. I, n- I know who she is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he mows down cops and causes spectacle chaos before stealing a cop's Honda CRF 250. So Bond steals a random civvies, also Honda CRF 250, and gives chase. Product placement. This dude just happens to have the exact same motorcycle? They're very popular over there. Very popular. Eve smashes out the busted safety glass and follows. The music is exciting and everything fast-paced, but not insanely fast like Quantum of Solace. There's plenty of stunt work in the crashes and the like so far, letting you know off the bat, we backed a spectacle bond. Oh yeah, this is big spectacle bond. Tanner directs Eve, while M says we cannot lose that list. Bond chases Patrice through the alleys, into and up buildings, and, of course, onto the rooftops, which is just shot breathtakingly. This movie is shot fantastically. The stunt work is actually pretty good, too. Kudos to those motorcycle riders. They ride through a stained glass window of the Grand Bazaar and through the bazaar itself. We then cut to Eve, hitting every bloody car around. It's sad how obvious they're shining the light of inadequacy onto this girl. Which we'll understand later, but Jesus, they don't have to do her so dirty by making her so completely inept. She could have been smart and capable and just in the end made the opposite decision that Bond made at the end of Casino Royale. That the job wasn't worth her humanity. But no, just make her the worst. She literally causes more damage than both the other two in this chase. Yeah, yeah, and I don't like how they did that. Because yes, they show her to be inept. Get behind the desk, woman. Mm. And even worse, when Patrice abandons his bike to jump off a bridge and onto a train, she just wantonly fires into a crowd at him, and Bond is even pissed about this. But he doesn't really have time to be pissed, so he guns his bike and flips it over the side of the bridge, which somehow doesn't ragdoll launch Bond forward, but instead just gives him a good controlled leap onto the train. (laughs) It's because Bond is a practice stuntman which he still almost falls off of, barely grabbing on with one hand and just showing off that superior grip strength of his. Right. Bond climbs up and moves forward. Eve chases, and Patrice fires at Bond. Right when I was going to make fun of Patrice's infinite ammo, I noticed he changed his clip to a shorter one, then changes it again shortly after. Oh yeah, that kind of set up eats bullets. I think if they didn't focus on the fact that he was changing clips, we would have called that one out so fast. Oh yeah, definitely call that out. Bond jumps into an excavator and swings it around when he's hit by one of Patrice's rounds. VW Beetles get shoved off the train, and Eve swerves to barely avoid them, but was also paid to verbally call them out. (laughs) Product placement? Not subtle, either. Bond pushes the machine forward, with the scoop shielding him now. He crushes even more cars. They destroyed like a hundred cars for this opening. Jesus. It was like demolition derby. Patrice severs the train coupling by shooting it, so Bond slams the scoop into the back of the train car. It digs into the roof and starts tearing it away as the cars separate. Bond gets out and runs along the arm, leaps for the train car as it rips away, and lands, fixing his cuff as the entire back of the train rips away behind him. It's beyond badass and suave. It's that super cool you associate with Bond in one of its most iconic forms. Oh, it is definitely super cool and suave, but I just marveled at how that excavator had uh, little platforms on the arm, so you could easily walk across it. Yours doesn't? No, no. Oh, you got ripped off. I guess I did. I guess I did. My excavator has a killdozer upgrade. Oh, very nice. The chase continues through the city of Adana, 
almost 500 miles to the southeast. And the iconic bridge, in a second, is the Varda Viaduct, near the village of Kirilon, about 30 miles northwest of Vadana. The train enters the tunnel, and Eve peels off along the road away from them. When the train exits the dark tunnel, Patrice is jumped by Bond, who climbed on top of the train. They fight up there, because it's Bond. He fights on trains. Patrice whips a heavy chain around at Bond as Eve tries to keep up. Bond stands over Patrice and chokes the man by trying to rip the hard drive from the necklace around Patrice's neck. But another tunnel pops up, and they dive down, barely avoiding becoming the tunnel's next red paint job. (laughs) Overall, these last few Bond movies, the fight choreography has really stepped up its game, for the most part. They continue to fight for the hard drive as Eve drives ahead, and this fight has its moments, and it's not bad. But it does feel a lot slower and less visceral than Craig's last two films, or the fights that are later in this movie. Probably because they're like laying down on a train, though. Well, yeah. It's no bathroom fight from Casino Royale. That's for damn sure. It's probably because without the room to do that, they were more focused on like what stunts they could do in the fight. But it does kind of give it that old Bond fight feel. Yeah, it does. Eve runs out of road and sets up to snipe Patrice when they pop out of the tunnel. But when they do... Bond is blocking her shot. She reinforces to M, the shot is not clean. Not clean? At almost no point do you even have a shot. At almost no point do you even have a shot. That's the dirtiest shot ever. (laughs) M says, take the shot. She repeats her order, and Eve says she'll hit Bond, because that's the only thing in front. Right? Because that's the shot. Um, you know, honestly, I have no shot. Yeah, is what you should have said. I have no shot. <laughs> M commands, take the bloody shot. Which, as telegraphed as this was with her ineptitude and obvious bad shot, it still sucks the air from your lungs when it hits. Oh, yeah. Nobody expects it to hit. Everybody sees it coming, but they're like, no, oh, she's not going to hit Bond. She fires, and Bond is hit in the chest, knocking him from the train and down at least 100 feet into the water below. Patrice looks at her as the train zooms off into the next tunnel, as if to say, Thanks, lady. Mm-hmm. Obviously. Silence grips the film and all of its characters until Eve finally reports, Agent down. M's soul sinks. She just turns, facing out the window, watching the English rain. I almost use that as the poster for this film, because this choice is such a pivotal part of the film. It is literally a moment of self-reflection. Literally. She is looking at herself. Literal moment of self-reflection. Did I just make the right choice? Hell no. Should I have trusted Bond to finish the job? Yes. Yada, yada, yada. Well, yeah, we all know the answers to these questions. But now M has to reflect on the choices that she has just made. We cut back to Bond as he falls down some small falls when the opening chords of Adele's Skyfall strike up. And we transition to the title sequence by having Bond dragged down into a vacuumous hole in the riverbed. Paper target bonds with bullet holes float in the dark waters. This is the end. I've drowned and dreamt this moment. Floating siren-like females, his Walther hitting the sand, kicking it up and transitioning to a Skyfall manor theme with falling weapons that turn to tombstones and continued cloudy blues that turn blood red as we plow through a headstone and the chorus hits. I'm torn on this title sequence because I like it, but I thought, I don't know, I feel like it could have been better. I like it. I like it a lot. And the iconography and the imagery of this scene are really good. They even foreshadow M's death if you watch when they show Judy Dench as M. It's right, o- right on a fucking tombstone. I feel like Quantum of Solace, the titles, like if you took the songs away mm-hmm. and we were just going visually and thematically, Quantum of Solace is better. Yes. But the song is so terrible in that one and so good in this one that I like this one better. I see. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Co-producers Andrew Noakes and David Pope. We see Bond's eye hidden behind the crumbling door of Skyfall and its stag statue. Flying through, we see him in the London underground, surrounded by shifting sands and shadows, including Silvis, and then move again to smoky, wispy tentacles of blood and water. I feel like the tentacles were always like a hint. Lead up to Spectre. I mean, it kind of fades into a skull with the blood tentacles, so I felt it was kind of a lead into Spectre. And they had just gotten the rights in between the last film and this one. Mm-hmm. And I think they knew what they were doing next. Yeah. 
At the end of this pre-title sequence, if you notice, Bond is fighting reflections of himself, who Silva is supposed to be. Supervising art director Chris Lowe, set decor Anna Pennick, production supervisor Janine Motter. The tentacles of blood in the water lead to a center connecting body in the shape of a skull, like an octopus with a skull head. Very specterish. Hail Hydra! Visual effects and miniature supervisor Steve Begg, associate producer Greg Wilson, first assistant director Michael Lerman. Main titles designed by old boy Danny Kleinman. Been a minute, but they got him back. Yay! That's the uh, Brosnan era guy. It's probably why I didn't like it as much. The paper bonds burn, and Chinese dragons dance across the screen. Special effects supervisor Chris Corbold, and stunts by Gary Powell. Love that man. Mm-hmm. Doing a great job. Second unit, Alex Witt. We're hit with kaleidoscope action with inverted and mirrored nude girls and guns. Yeah, right back to old school forms. Like the first half of this pre-title sequence is trying to be different and unique and everything. And then right in the middle, it switches right back to the old silhouettes and kaleidoscopes. I liked it. Paying homage, perhaps? I liked what they were doing with the kaleidoscopes because it turned the iconography into like crosses and stuff later. Yeah, yes. Edited by Stuart and Kate Baird. Nice cross from mirrored deer heads. Trippy. Director of photography, Roger Deakins. The teeth in this skull turn into headstones as we zoom into it. Welcome back, Danny Kleinman. (laughs) This guy makes pretty titles with surface value shallow thematic guidelines, but they are pretty. They are pretty. Oh no, a headstone that says Bond? Oh, you think they're going to kill James Bond right in the beginning again? This isn't another Bond fake-out opener, but more of a nod to them. Yeah. We know he has a whole movie, and we have all seen the trailers. Oh, what is this, the third time? Fourth time? Every time. (laughs) Every time? Production designer Dennis Gassner. Music by Thomas Newman, replacing David Arnold, who's now done his bit for Queen and Country. Mm. There's a really cool bit here with Bond's fractured reflections and him fighting them, as Carter had pointed out earlier. Mm -hmm. It's just a really good metaphor how, like, he's part of his own enemy, again, and also Silva is... A reflection. Another mirrored reflection of him, exactly. Mm Mm-hmm. Skyfall, performed by Adele. It's many people's number one Bond song of all time. And it won an Oscar, so it's really hard to argue with them. And it's definitely up there for me. I wouldn't say number one. I can't say number one because I like this song a lot. Oh, I love the song. I love belting it randomly in the car. But here's the reason why I don't think it's number one. I still hear Live and Let Die on the radio. I've gotten to be the opposite. Like, if I don't go out of my way to, like, put on Live and Let Die on Spotify, I literally, like, have Skyfall come on at work. (laughs) Executive producer Callum McDougal. We zoom into Bond's wounds, and the veins for trees and antlers motif is really good, but the blood rain here is lame as fuck. Yeah, see? Parts of it are really good, and then parts of it is just like, I hate to say it, but it's catchphrase time. Boring and pedantic. Written by the underrated geniuses Purvis and Wade with John Logan. Produced by Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli. Directed by Sam Mendez. Mendez is like a boxer who just throws wild haymakers. Mostly huge misses, but when he hits, they're fucking huge. Like American Beauty. Mm -hmm. This film in 1917. But that's less than a fourth of his films currently out. And I don't have much to say about the rest other than they range from just okay to downright terrible. Well, yeah. You know, somebody pointed out to me the other day, they're like, I never knew American Beauty was a type of rose. We return with an establishing exterior shot of Vauxhall Cross. M is struggling to write Bond's obit, and the camera is keyed on her porcelain British bulldog. No, not that one. (laughs) The British bulldog. We then cut to M being driven in a 2011 Jaguar XJL to a meeting in Trinity Square. We immediately cut inside to Gareth Mallory, a former lieutenant colonel in the British Army and now chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee, which regulates MI6. He's immortalized by Ray Fiennes, who auditioned for Bond in the 90s and has, you know, some other acting credits, maybe just a few. (laughs) Just a few. A few, Matthew, just a few. He was even an Avenger. Not that one, though. Not that one. Anybody who's watched our show knows that I love the Avengers. All those old spy shows, fucking, they were fantastic. I was also going to say, I think a Ray Fiennes James Bond would have been just fine. Mallory dispenses the pleasantries and the brandy, 
and then says he'll be Frank. Can I still be Garth? <laughs> uh. <laughs> the Prime Minister is concerned. M says, no worries, I got this. And Mallory asks if she's even thought about pulling her agents out en masse. She says she's thought about everything, and he calls out the evasive response. M is defensive as fuck and beyond testy. M is not going to sit here and take this posh bullshit. Uh, what, you mean accountability? Yes, accountability. Yes, 100%. <laughs> this posh bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Which is all he's asking for is accountability to the people that pay her. You know? <laughs> I mean, he, pretty, he pretty much says that. He's right. Deal with it. Yeah. Well, he's right. But are his methods correct? Yes. Uh, well. Mallory exposits it's been three months since she lost the knock list from Mission Impossible. <laughs> The knock list is out in the open again. Agents are at risk, and worse, they could be exposed for having such a stupid list and concealing it from their allies. M asks if this is civilian oversight, and he says, no, it's retirement planning. I have got to believe our intelligence agencies are smart enough to compartmentalize undercover operatives' <laughs> identities and not have them all on one fucking list. I believe it. You think so? Oh yeah, I believe it. But there's smart people in the government. No, there's not. There's a bunch of greedy assholes in the government. <laughs> your country appreciates you and all you've done. When you finish your current posting, you'll be awarded GCMG with honors. Congratulations. Now, she may be given the highest dame status, but she's just insulted. You're firing me? No, Mom. I'm just here to oversee the transition to your voluntary retirement in two months. Just leave with dignity. To hell with dignity. I'll leave when the job's done, M says, and leaves. I don't understand how that works. Because technically she is being fired, right? Yeah, in two months. He's asking her to resign in two months. Yeah. Giving her eight weeks notice. So how do you just keep your job? I'll leave when the job is done. Like The job's done in two months. We just said. Right? <laughs> I mean, you'll leave when we tell you, bitch. Right? Like, no, I'm staying in my post. Like, are you, though? Your security card's not going to work. Um, <laughs> but okay. But okay. We continue to follow M, and you should realize that she is a main character this time, not a side one. M is the Bond girl of this film, and the most tragic one since Tracy. I would agree. She is the Bond girl. As she heads back to Voxel Cross, Tanner gets a call alerting him that someone is trying to decrypt the stolen database. Tanner traces the encryption signal to Voxel Cross as the motorcade races for the building. Tanner explains that it's coming from behind their firewall, specifically M's computer. Tanner wants to shut it all down, but M says no, track it. M is so uncharacteristically impatient, impetuous, and foolishly brash. She's acting more like early Bond and less like his mom, forcing forward out of a refusal to stop, even when you know it's going to make things worse. Yeah, I don't. I don't know about M's character play here. Maybe in one of the first rights, one of the first drafts of this story, M knew more about what was going on and was trying to hide it. I just feel like they're just having her act younger than she is so they can move things forward and just hoping that her behavior is explained by an oversized ego. Like her, she refuses to go down with a tarnished legacy. It's more important than being knighted. Yes. I don't know. She feels some kind of way about her legacy, I guess. Tanner's screen is then taken over by an image of the Union Jack background and M in the center oval window, contrasted in black and white. She's given a puppet mouth that laughs and a voxel cross crown. Her face flashes with a skull, oddly enough with the Day of the Dead decoration on it, before switching to a black screen that says, Think on your sins. They're stopped by a police roadblock on Voxel Bridge, and M gets out to be a Karen when the upper two floors of the MI6 headquarters explode. Nice fucking model, honk. <laughs> nice fucking model. Actually, it wasn't that good. I've seen better models in older films. I just wanted to quote Beetlejuice. I know. I love that movie, too. We are constantly, and again, focused on the look of defeat on M's face, as she's just handed loss after loss and is now desperate to clean up her mess before being forced out. But it's only getting worse. And yes, this does mildly explain her behavior, 
but not really. No, not really. Not at all. And I think that's why there's so much expository dialogue later in the movie. We then cut to Bond in a beachfront shack on Coco Calis Beach at Fethayi, Turkey. Here, he's been recuperating and enjoying some local cuisine, played by Tanya Sotiropolo. Mm. <laughs> he spends his days fucking and drinking his sponsored Heineken's, spending his nights staring off distantly, over-medicating, and playing drinking games with scorpions. <laughs> he stares the scorpion down, chugs his drink, and glasses the scorpion to the delight of this bar built for the film. It's a badass scene. It is a badass scene. It's reminiscent of Indiana Jones bullshit. Tough guy Bond in Morocco, like... It's not tough guy Bond, it's broken Bond, and it immediately sets that up. This guy is doing everything you do when you don't even care if you live tomorrow. Right. When you don't care anymore. He's like living at the bottom of a bottle. Some old Alan Quartermain bullshit. The roar cuts as the film cuts to Bond later that day in the now empty bar sulking when he just grabs a whole bottle from over the bar we get it he's lost he doesn't even know what to do with himself even though the tv had no sound before we can hear it just in time to hear wolf fucking blitzer report on the mi6 terrorist attack and that wakes bond up he turns to look at the telly just in time to see footage of a smoking voxel cross and his look is amazing it's fear he's afraid for his mom hearing six people died and you know this Bond and his mom. Someone fucked up. Mm-hmm. Someone just attacked his mom. He took one look at that photograph on television and was like, that's mom's office. Someone's about to pay. Right. Cut to M at the funeral of the victims of the attack, filmed at the old Royal Naval College in London. The report said six people died, but there's eight caskets, draped with Union Jacks and beautifully framed. Tanner tells her it's time to go, and she promises she'll find whoever did this. Oh, she'll find them, or they'll find her first. I was about to say, they'll find her, really. If you want to find out who did this, just go along with their plan. In the end, it's just like, am I to be bait? You should have been in the first place. Right? You are the object he's after. Like, we should have used you in the first place. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Back at Im's house, the exterior of which is John Barry's old home, she grabs her bottle of scotch. In the dark. Because as natural as turning the light on first thing is... It would have ruined the reveal that Bond is hiding in her flat again, even though he promised not to do that. <laughs> he did. He said, yes, mom. I was noticing back in the office with Mallory, Mallory pours her a scotch. Is there a lot of day drinking around MI6? God, yes. Because it seems to happen fucking frequently, right? Like every time they're in an office, they're drinking scotch. Am I wrong about that? No. Okay. They're alcoholics. Apparently. MI6 started out as an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. <laughs> You're like, oh, we're all bloody spies. We should get together and drink. <laughs> Where the hell have you been? Enjoying death. 007 reporting for duty. He's plastered and has a bottle in his hand. Hasn't changed clothes since he left wherever he was. Obviously went straight there. He's snappy and rude and with reason. What was it you said? Take the bloody shot i would be a little pissed off too he got shot in the shoulder he got shot period she said take the shot it's her fault i'd be a little upset im rationalizes that she made a judgment call even though she has the hindsight to let her know she fucked up and has been stepping in it since it, it was her job but fuck you bond stuffs that and says she should have trusted him that was a huge theme of the last film mm-hmm Fuck, this movie doesn't care much about the characters these two have established and grown over the last two films, does it? I mean, if we're being honest, it really doesn't. If we're being honest, it really doesn't, because the character growth was way different in the first two movies. M is what this movie needs her to be. Right, and M is just, she's the MacGuffin that drives the protagonist. M again rationalizes that it was the possibility of losing Bond or the certainty of losing the list. But being as the outcome lost the list anyways, this argument is completely invalid. I don't disagree with you. Invalid argument. You should have trusted me. Bun says she lost her nerve, and yep, he nailed it. He nailed it. She acted uncharacteristically and uh, paid for it. You know the game. We've both been playing long enough. Bond stabs may be too long. Speak for yourself, M-guards. 
This defensiveness I just don't buy from a woman of her experience and age. Like I said, it's a little out of character for where she's been since Brosnan. Well, she's a different character than the Brosnan era, completely, by the way. Yeah, yeah. That's not a theory. In Casino Royale, I had that theory and I said it. I was like, I think this is a different character. The other one was a bean counter. This one seems to be an ex-agent. Right. But I've actually found interviews with the producers and the writers from this time. And M is a completely different character in this reboot. She's the same actress. She's playing an M, but they made her a different backstory and a different person. Well, yeah. She seems like a different person. So Brosnan's M is really not this M. If Desmond Llewellyn was still alive, he would have been playing Q, I promise. I, pro- I, I know. But it was a reboot. Yeah. M asks why Bond came back, and he says, good question. Because we're under attack and you know we need you. Bond inhales deeply, but shakily, eyes red as fuck, nodding his head involuntarily. Well, I'm here. M says he'll need to be debriefed and cleared for service. She also informs him that they sold his flat and put his shit in storage. Maybe call next time and let us know you aren't dead. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I, I, I can't argue that. And he can't either. Maybe I should have called. <laughs> How much time do you think passed? Six weeks? It's been three months since she lost the list. Uh We cut to Bond, being driven in a black Range Rover to the standby underground facility as headquarters was attacked, and it's entered by the underground Smithfield car park. The subterranean interior is, as you might expect, a different locale. The brick corridors and training area are the old Vic tunnels beneath Waterloo Station. Winston Churchill's hooker tunnels. I heard about those. Tanner briefs Bond on the attack and says this place was part of Churchill's bunkers, and that they are now at war themselves. It'd be quite fascinating if it weren't for the rats. Big, nasty rats. Not the last time rats come up in this movie. Tanner also tells Bond about Mallory as they enter the new MI6 proper. We then cut to Bond being put through rigorous physical tests in mini-montage form, while Tanner exposits the entire time. I never really realized how cheesy this was until now. (laughs) Every time they cut, he's just like mid-sentence. Tanner is in this whole movie to exposit. It's his job. It's always his job, but at least it usually doesn't feel so obvious. (laughs) Right, it doesn't feel so obvious, but in this one, it is. Change his name to Expo Dump, man. Right? The whole movie, too. In the last one, he came off like, yes, he's an Expo Dump, but he came off as like this beacon of hope and trust. In this, he's just an Expo Dump. In the last one, he had a character. We then cut to Bond in a firing range. There's a tremble in his hand when he aims, and his shot is off. He fires again and again but misses. Frustrated, he rushes the target, firing. This moment is brilliant, honestly. It is, because it shows, like, he don't got it no more, but he's just frustrated enough to just, you know, do it anyway. It shows that Bond's natural state, when he loses all control and all training, is to just push forward, no matter what, as long as he still can, until whatever he needs to do is done. Even if he's already failed, even if he's already lost. Right. And not going to stop. That is one of the biggest traits of Craig's Bond, and scenes like this constantly show it. Yeah. Now, the next scene isn't really as brilliant as the last one. Bond sits with a shrink named Dr. Hall, played by Nicholas Woodison. He does the word association bit, and Bond responds to it, as I do, with sarcastic or cynical responses espoused with disdain, even calling him a bitch to reinforce that he's still quite cross with her. Over the whole, you know, being shot thing. <laughs> I, I would be too, Matthew. I can't, I can't fault the man. Oh, bro, I'd be pissed. <laughs> I hold grudges over far less. It's like, you had me shot. No, I'm still pissed at you, lady. Trust. Trust. This is going to last for a while. I'm going to bring it up every Christmas. Every Christmas. You got me a gift? I didn't need nothing. I still got this one you got me on my shoulder. In my shoulder. I still have the gift you got me so many years ago. You fucking bitch. (laughs) They play this dance until the doctor says the word Skyfall, and that's it. Bond's out. Fuck this shit. (laughs) This shit is honestly dumb in the long run. It's just there for the mystery bite of the trailers to get us into the movie and buzzing on the title. I mean, and it worked. (laughs) But Skyfall's his childhood home. And if he did have some feeling worth potentially throwing away his return assessment over, it's never addressed or even brought up again. Right. 
throughout the whole movie. I mean, yeah, he hasn't been there in a while, and his parents' death, and it's also a lot of trauma associated with it, and he's got to go face it, and that's hard. But that doesn't seem like, oh, I'm so offended, I'm just throwing away my review now. My potential return. Right. The stupid. Even after mom told me to take it seriously. And I'm mad at her, but she's still mom. Right. I mean, I did get shot, though. <laughs> I did get shot. We then see Bond trying to take his shirt off and having a hard time of it. His shoulder is still fucked. There's fragments still in there. This Bond carries the emotional weight and physical injuries of his past adventures. They don't magically reset. He's aging, noticeably. And that's not a bad thing this time. Because not only do they acknowledge it, not only is it a focal point of this story, but it's crucial to this Bond's continued growth in his full arc from start to finish of his career. This is one of the best aspects of Craig's Bond. He's not immortal. He's not impervious to consequence. In fact, it's far more realistic as to what this kind of life would be like than we've ever had in the franchise. Right? I'm surprised he's not deaf or concussed. Bruce Willis style. Right? So then, Bond digs out his own bullet fragments with a pocket knife. Bro, you're in a state-of-the-art facility, okay? (laughs) Wait, right? I was thinking the same thing. Why don't you just have him pull that out and stitch it back up? Give you a couple of pain meds. Because that ain't Rambo. That ain't Rambo. Pour some gunpowder in there. Stitch up my own wound. (laughs) He gives Tanner the fragments to be analyzed and says, for her eyes only. I love that. Mm -hmm. We then cut to Eve beckoning Bond into M's office and apologizing for shooting Bond. It was only four ribs, some non-vital organs, nothing major. (laughs) When he ribbed her driving in the opening sequence, it had a tinge of his five-year-old bully flirting. And here it is again. He's flirting with Money Penny every time he's around her, and in the same way that he did with Vesper. Yeah, he likes this girl. I like this girl. He does. Yeah. It's like the second girl we've actually seen like that genuine attraction to that he does that little five-year-old flirtiness with. Right. This location is amazing. The banter is cute. The blocking is fantastic. The gist is Eve has been suspended from fieldwork and is helping Mallory with the transition. Bond quips to warn him if they let her back out in the field. It wasn't funny, though. No, 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 no. Most of the one-liners in this aren't funny because they're all dad jokes. Yeah. Inside M's new office, Bond laughs the bulldog survived the blast when Mallory enters and introduces himself to Bond. M says Bond passed his tests by the skin of his teeth and is back on active duty. Mallory congratulates Bond, who tries to duck out, but before he gets far, Mallory adds, Just one thing. Why not stay dead? You are out. Not many get out so easy. It's a young man's game. There's no shame admitting you've lost a step. Better than dying over it. So, just trying to be a dick? Or... No, the opposite, I feel like. We'll find out later. He did not pass any of those tests. And Silva's right. Im knows that. And knowing that, she's sending him out to die. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's James Bond. But in real life, any normal agent that's that physically and emotionally wrecked, you're sending them to their death. Not to accomplish anything. And Mallory is calling this out. That's fair. No shame in it saying that, like, I need some more time. No shame in saying I can't do this anymore. It's a young man's game. This job takes people who are close to broken and it completely shatters them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not stupid. Unless you're a fucking superhero, you're going to go out there and get killed. And that's all we're going to accomplish. If anything, you can fuck things up worse. This just seems like another bad M decision, but the only thing I can do right now is sit back and let her make them. Right. Otherwise, the movie doesn't happen. Bond says, hire me or fire me. It's up to you. He's no time for any of this. M sticks up for Bond, and Mallory calls her sentimental. She says, for however much time she has left, she chooses her agents. And Mallory says, fair enough. And to Bond, he says, don't cock it up. Nah, because that's all Bond does in all of his movies is cock it up. He leads with his cock. Craig was hired at the perfect time to have boyish looks in his first film. But by the time they've gotten to this one, he's getting noticeably older. And if we're honest, that man kind of ages fast. He, he does kind of age fast. Daniel Craig, I mean, not Bond. And that helps with my theory that many years take place between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall with the bulk of his career missions with many more between Skyfall and Spectre, before No Time to Die takes place relatively soon after Spectre, as Quantum of Solace did with Casino Royale. Hmm. He started around my age and he ended around your age. 
It took him three more years to make five movies than it took Roger to make seven. Yeah, there you go. Made me feel like he did his whole career in five films. It shows that he's human. Right. Tanner has analyzed the bullet fragments from Patrice's gun. It's depleted uranium. And they trace that to Patrice to identify him as the man who Bond fought. Patrice is being monitored and is scheduled to be in Shanghai for a meeting. M says Bond's going there to find out who has the list and terminate Patrice for the agents he killed, which Bond is happy to do. M tells Bond to go see the new quartermaster, and when Bond leaves, Tanner says he didn't know Bond passed the tests, to which M responds, he didn't. If I were Tanner, I would be like, well, what the fuck? Why would you send him out there by himself? <laughs> Give him some backup at least. Like, what are you doing? This is why they're forcing you out. <laughs> You're right? Are you crazy, woman? We cut to Bond, walking into the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square. He sits in front of J.M.W. Turner's masterpiece, The Fighting Temeraire. Turner's painting shows the final journey of the Temeraire, as the ship is towed from Kent, along the River Thames, to southeast London, where it was to be scrapped. The veteran warship had played a distinguished role in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, but by 1838 was over 40 years old and had been sold off by the Admiralty. And while we are all meant to see the obvious parallels with Bond, especially when reinforced by a whippersnapper in a moment, the real parallel is M, retired despite her distinguished service and on her last journey, whereas he will live to die another day. As Bond stares at the painting, a young man played by Ben Wishaw sits way too close to him and says, It's a bit melancholy, the grand warship being hauled away for scrap. The inevitability of time. What do you see? A bloody big ship. Excuse me. Bond grumbles and goes to leave. 007, I'm your new quartermaster. You've got to be joking. You still have spots. <laughs> Q says he can do more damage on his laptop before his morning tea than Bond can do in a year in the field. I doubt that very seriously. Apparently he has not read Bond's case file. I don't doubt that because Silva just proved it by blowing up MI6 with his laptop. Yeah, yeah, he did. But this James Bond we're talking about, he does more damage on accident. You could sink a country with a few clicks on a laptop in a stock market. You could. Oh, so what do you need me for then? Every now and then a trigger has to be pulled, Q says coldly. Bond looks at him with contempt and says, or not pulled. It's hard to know which in your pajamas. Real talk, though. Now that was a good comeback. Mm-hmm. Q gives Bond a handshake, a ticket to Shanghai with all the travel arrangements, and a Walther coded to Bond's palm. He also gives Bond a radio transmitter. A gun and a radio? Not exactly Christmas, is it? Were you expecting an exploding pen? We don't really go in for that anymore. Was that supposed to be funny? It kind of was. It made the audience chuckle. It made me chuckle. It made this theater laugh. I mean, he has a point, and it's kind of like a riff on the, on the series and the critique they were getting by the end of Brosnan's run. And we had the same movie for 40 years. This is fun. Fuck off. It is, and I like it. Q gets up and says, good luck out there. Please return the equipment in one piece. It's a nice character callback, but what equipment? <laughs> like, he always loses his gun. It's the first thing they take when I get caught. Because I always get caught. That's my plan. You don't understand. I have to find the secret hideout. The best way to do that is to get caught. But when he got caught, no one frisked him for his fucking radio that was just in his pants pocket? I guess not. Like, he didn't, like, shove it in his little boot heel space like Connery. Like, he didn't shove it up his ass like Christopher Walken. Wait, what? <laughs> Might have just squoze it in between those perfect butt cheeks and held it there. For those glutes, he probably could hold it there for hours. Days. <laughs> I held this watch up my ass for. <laughs> we cut to an establishing shot of the Shanghai skyline at night. Gorgeous. We pan over the city to a penthouse suite with a pool, then cut to a tracking shot of Bond swimming in the pool with the city below him. The cinematographer truly is on God mode, but Bond's hotel is the swimming pool at the VA Cannery Riverside Club in Cannery Wharf with a view of Shanghai added digitally. In fact, most of the Shanghai scenes are shot in London. Yeah. Don't you like that tracking swimming shot, don't you? I do. I like the shots are great. And we're going to get into one of the more iconic shots here pretty soon. Bond at all points in this film is at odds with himself. 
He is constantly pushing himself to the point of exhaustion, but never without his overbearing detachment. Well, at least he stopped drinking, sort of. Later, he drinks at the hotel bar when he gets a text <laughs> with a flight number and time. He puts down the phone, and the camera holds on his distant but bitter face as the screech of a jet engine rises over him. Another Hollywood trope is one for showing a character being mentally overwhelmed by holding on them staring off while playing the jarring background noise of the next scene over them for a moment. Another trick that now you know you'll never not notice when they do it. Yep. There was a whole lot of full facial holds in this too. It's because until he shaves, he's lost himself. Yeah. Lose yourself in your face. We cut to Pudong International Airport, actually shot at the then new grandstand at Royal Ascot Racecourse in Berkshire, where they shot a scene from a view to a kill. Bond dressed as a chauffeur and is awaiting the flight when Patrice steps off. Bond, even though disguised, cold stares the man from like 10 feet away. <laughs> but to be fair, Patrice fought the dude for a few minutes and then thought he was dead ever since. I don't remember people I deal with from work just once either. Yeah, this is true. And nobody really notices the help. Let's talk about the music. It's loud and bombastic when needed. It adds cultural flair for the different locations or completely changes style when the movie shifts gears. Contemporary for classier scenes and more modern electronic for the more tense espionage-driven segments. It's really fucking good, especially in the beginning. Overall, I dug the sound design of the whole film so far, and the music is outstanding throughout. Patrice leaves in a 1999 VW Passat taxi, and Bond follows in a 2010 Mercedes-Benz S300 to a striking X-braced office block, which was shot at the Broadgate Tower in Bishopsgate. Patrice enters and shoots the doorman before heading up the tower. Bond grabs his coated gun and follows. Patrice enters a lift, and when it starts up, Bond charges it, climbing and jumping for the bottom to dead hang as it rises higher and higher. Because Bond has superior grip strength. Wait, what's this? He's trembling and breathing hard? <laughs> Looking at his hands as if it's getting harder to hold on? Holy shit. He even has to let go and do the climber shake for the lactic acid buildup. And grabbing again in a different way to work different muscles. Wow. Yeah, so much for superior grip strength, huh? I love the fact that they show him getting older. They kind of drive it home, yes. It's a little bit blunt, yes, but it's fitting in the story. I love the fact that they allow Bond to be human, because regardless of what you want to tell yourselves when you're complaining on Facebook, that makes it far more compelling. Mm -hmm. We had gotten to a point in Brosnan's films where I just expected everything to be fine. I was just waiting to see how it was. The tension was long dead after 40 years of making the same movie. And yet, in the beginning of this one, we're all expecting Bond to be fine, and he gets shot, and it sucks the air from our lungs. Now anything can happen. Right? He could have fallen from that elevator. At the top of the tower, Patrice exits the lift, and Bond climbs up over dizzying heights. Well, he's spent. Hope he doesn't have to do any hand-to-hand -hand combat for his life or anything in the next, like, five minutes. Right? <laughs> he enters the floor that's bathed in dancing blue lights from the Shanghai skyline around them. A man of war dances across the windows. Bond sneaks in, watching Patrice trying to cut a hole in a window. The light pouring in and the reflections of it and the men on all the glass create some of the most stunning imagery that we've seen in this franchise, if not the most. This scene right here is iconic and has been copied since. Including Mission Impossible. And Shang-Chi. Patrice assembles his rifle staring at an exotic woman and some men in the tower across, while Bond tries to creep on him. The rising tension in the music, the dancing of the lights, this scene is so deserving of its iconic status. The music builds until Patrice fires at his target, killing the man, who was set up properly for the kill by the exotic woman and her men, as they had him seated to view a painting. They also don't flinch or react, just move to clean up the body. Well, I say that, but the woman does rock back at the shot and put her hand to her chest in shock. Maybe she was just surprised when it happened. The glass shattering is kind of... It's meant to show that she still has some sort of innocence in her soul. Like, she's forced to do this. She wouldn't be doing it if it was her choice. It still kills her soul, whatever's left of it. Right. But just as quickly as Patrice can chamber a new round, he stands turning to fire on Bond. He knew he was there. Bond strafes, and Patrice fires wantonly, shattering glass around them 
and a giant pane of a side window leading to a precarious drop. They grapple and struggle for the gun. The fight is a return to the quick, brutal, visceral combat of Craig's Bond, the more orchestral music and its tempo highlighting the danger and the stakes. The dancing man of war and the blue ambience around the black silhouettes fighting over the rifle and to the death. It's bloody amazing. It is amazing. This is such a well shot scene. Two silhouettes going man to man over a rifle. They have the room to fight and fight hard. It is so good. Surrounded by neon. This makes up for the train fight by far. As I said, this scene right here is iconic. Bond stomps the rifle down and shoulder flips Patrice over the windowsill, holding the man's arm as the camera sweeps over both of them to highlight the height. Who got the list? Bond angrily screams. Patrice is slipping, and Bond demands Patrice to tell him who he's working for. But Patrice just slips away into nothing. Bond is pissed the guy didn't talk before he fell, too. He pushes away from the edge and locks eyes with the exotic woman. And she's hot. Super hot. The camera cuts to a close-up of her, and Bond pulls a Batman. na 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 Where'd he go? <laughs> so that painting that was being shown off to their victim was our second special painting for this film, Modigliani's Woman with a Fan. It was stolen from the Museum of Modern Art in Paris in 2010. Speculation is that it really did end up in China, too. This is a device which was also in the first Bond film, Dr. No, in 1962, and so it's a way of referencing 50 years of Bond. Dr. No's lair was adorned with Francisco Goya's Portrait of the Duke of Wellington as a way of expressing the villain's hubristic aspirations, and Max Zorn's desk, in a view to a kill, was flanked by Jacques-Louis David's portrait of Napoleon for the same effect. Bond rifles through Patrice's spy case and finds a special chip to a casino in Macau, and we cut back to London. M is in her house, looking at her laptop, when another hacker graphic pops up, this time a slot machine that says, Have you been thinking? and starts spinning. All five slots land on the sugar skull icon again, and it says, Click here to claim your prize. Don't click those, Grandma. It's always a virus. It's always a virus. Like, you're a top MI6 agent. Why would you not immediately get on the phone with Tanner and be like, hey, look, he's messaging me right now. He's got something on my computer. I need you to send a team over here right away. Don't we have some new, like, 15-year-old super hacker? Quartermaster? Yeah. Like, why isn't he immediately on this? But no, Granny. Go ahead. Click it. (laughs) So M clicks it. It takes her to a YouTube video leak of five agents with real-world photo comparisons and real names alongside the covers. Luckily, it has no likes, no comments, and she's the first view. So it's probably dead in the algorithm, and just like our show, no one's going to see it. Why don't you just get on the phone with YouTube and tell them to immediately take that shit down? M calls Tanner to order him to pull all the agents out now, as the video threatens to expose five more agents every week and implores M again to think on her sins. Crossfade to Macau, the chip having led Bond to the fake Golden Dragon Casino, a nod to the man with the golden gun in an equally fake Macau. The club does not exist outside of Pinewood Studios, where even the dazzling exterior with its bridge, its 300 floating lanterns, and 30-foot high dragon heads were created in the studio's paddock tank. Really? Stunning work, gents. Fucking stunning. That's not a real casino? Well done, Jesus. In his hotel, Bond creams a lather brush to shave when he gets a knock at the door. He approaches the door drawn, but when he hears Eve's voice say room service, he just chuckles. I didn't order anything. Even you. Eve has new info, and Bond calls her overqualified to be a messenger. She tells him the list has been cracked, and he gets ready to shave. Cutthroat razor. How very traditional. Eve charms. Cutthroat razor sales spiked over 400% in the UK after this movie, and that's not a joke. That's a fact. Really? 400%. There's a lot of razor attacks because there are no guns in the UK. There's a lot of kids running around with straight razors right now. Bond says he likes to do some things the old-fashioned ways, and she says sometimes the old ways are the best ways. He stops and hands her the razor. You willing to put your life in my hands again? The next scene is amazing. It's intimate. It's iconic. The blocking is more genius than you'll ever realize. Yeah. A near nude and vulnerable Bond sitting in a wicker chair in a similar position just with his hands in front of him this time. Yeah. The person kneeling over him with the blade, this time trusting and affectionate. 
This is symbolistic of a major point of healing for Bond, regaining that piece of himself that he let go on that bridge, a piece that had long been fractured and barely hanging on. Yes, it, it's like he's finally recovered from Vesper. Finally learning to move on from everything. Yeah. Bond says M's already briefed him on the list. So why is she actually there? To spy for Mallory? They expo dump Mallory, which really telegraphs his longevity in the franchise. And, by way, telegraphs M's death later. Again. Again. Mallory was a lieutenant colonel who was captured by the IRA. So he's no paper pusher. But more importantly, what's in Eve's blouse? (laughs) She tuts Bond, tells him to keep still as this is the tricky part, whilst waving the razor in his face. Almost, boys. We almost had it finally. Yeah, we almost had it finally. I think they smashed right after this. She runs the razor up his throat and cleans away the grizzled, distant bond. Old dog, new tricks. Which is an innocuous line that's actually the theme of the movie. Again, right, not subtle with it. And we cut to the, I'm sorry, but motherfucking iconic lantern entrance to the casino. Shuttled by village motorboat through a lagoon and the mouth of a dragon while fireworks explode overhead. And he looks dapper as fuck. I mean, not Goldfinger or Casino Royale good, but nice. Yeah, I don't think Wardrobe did him justice this movie. I, I don't remember any standout moments, so I was like, damn, he looks good. Yeah, his tux here, he looks good, but it's a little plain. Yeah, I was too focused on everything else, but you're right. It's like there's nothing that really stood out wardrobe-wise. I mean, you could say like his training gear. People loved it. They sell it on Facebook. Bond fans like his training gear for some reason. But if the biggest hit of your Bond wardrobe in your movie was the training sweats. Yeah. (laughs) Was your sweatpants. Yeah, that's not a good wardrobe. Then the wardrobe sucked. Yeah, that's not a good wardrobe look. The music dances, the Bond theme, and the Skyfall refrain elements around each other perfectly as Bond approaches. They love this center framing technique to elongate distances or heighten the aura of characters as seen below. It's constantly and effectively used in this film. Yeah. I said it at the beginning. He likes to end it. He likes to begin and end scenes with a photo, something nice center blocked the scene. And it's all crisp. It's it it looks good. I feel like you're giving him way too much credit and he was just obsessively using the same shooting technique. Yeah. Okay. I could be. I could be giving him too much credit. But maybe maybe you're right, though. Maybe you are the one who's right. I could be right. I may be crazy. The entrance bridge is over a Komodo dragon pit. The casino glows gold. Bond walks in and sees Eve drinking against a column. They have earpieces, and he leads with, don't touch your ear. (laughs) Call back to Carter? The white Carter. Yeah. Specifically. Specifically. He doesn't work here anymore. Yeah, I I had to get rid of that guy. First of all, you're bad for the name. Secondly, you're a bad agent. He fired into a crowd. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they walk around the room and make thematic small talk when Bond takes Patrice's special chip to the cashier. She drops her head, says, one moment, and disappears, as Bond and the exotic woman again lock eyes. Bond is then presented with a case by the casino manager, played by Chui Bay, who says, good fortune tonight, sir. The woman starts down the stairs, and Bond never takes his eyes from her, as he says, let's hope so. Was he watching her, or was he watching the bodyguards? He was watching her, you know, good fortune tonight. Yeah, let's hope so, baby. Let's hope so. He lifts the case to see a hefty payment meant for Patrice. He's also given a handful of chips to play with. Compliments of the house. This is very sweet. Yeah, I wonder if they actually, like, had him playing something with Severine or something and cut it out. But that's pointless. Right. Again, like I said, rewrites in the script. It feels like it. There were certain things that weren't addressed, that were brought up, that weren't addressed again, things that were dropped, you know? Bond moves through the casino, and the camera trades subjects as he crosses with the woman's center frame, now following her as she's smoking a cigarette. This is Severine, played by Berenice Merlot. She based this character's voice and mannerisms heavily on Zinya on a top. And once you know that, you'll never unsee it from her performance. Yeah, thanks for saying something. I was like, oh yeah, I see it. She is totally Xenia on the top. I mean, she's not like a femme fatale, but like the way she acts and talks. The way she acts and talks, yeah, absolutely. She based it from Xenia in the casino scene. Yeah. She approaches Bond and says, now you can afford to buy me a drink. 
Wants his shit even too. I'm guessing there's over four million euros in here. Not bad, she affirms. She's been waiting to see who cashed the chip after his dramatic insertion into their dealings, and she loves a good plot twist. Bond gives his classic introduction here as well. Eve is jealous and calls Severine pretty, if you like that sort of thing. Bond pulls his earpiece and drops it in Eve's drink as he passes her, saying, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> is that why you don't think they smashed? Yeah, because he was too busy going after her. I don't think they smashed because this franchise will never let us have Money, Penny, and Bond. It's the ultimate cock tease. Uh. At the bar, Bond gets a perfect Vesper, and the pair size each other up before he says he wants to meet her employer. She takes a hard drag from her cigarette, her hand wildly trembling at the thought of the man, and says, Be careful what you wish for. Bond grabs her wrist and says, Nice show, but three bodyguards is excessive, and you look at them in fear. They're not protecting you, they're controlling you. He flips her wrist, exposing a tattoo marking of the Macau sex trade. She was sold into sex slavery as a child, and whoever her employer is was her way out. Maybe she thought she was even in love, but that was a long time ago. Bond hitting him with a Sherlock Holmes analysis. Well, he's gotten a lot better at it. He's gotten a lot better at it. We then get a trailer line to bolster the enemy in the classic cinema sin of telling us instead of showing us. How much do you know about fear? All there is. Not like this. Not like him. You don't think they showed us enough by having her being so afraid of him? Eh, not really. This is George lucas -y. Okay, I'll give you that one. It was a little campy. Bond promises to kill him if she brings Bond to him. Weak-ass promise. She says when she leaves, her guards will kill him. But if he survives, she's on the Chimera in North Harbor, Berth 7. Cast off in an hour. She tips a nod to Zinya on a top and says, Nice to meet you, Mr. Bond. At least she let him know that the guards were going to uh, kill him. I mean, come on, he knew. Well, he suspected. Bond turns, center frame blocking, in front of the long bar, back to the camera, and raises his glass to the guards in the background. Bond then makes for the exit with his money, but is pincered on the bridge over the pit. Bond pulls the fake tipsy routine before swinging his case into the face of each and every one of them multiple times. <laughs> Using your alcoholism as a spy tactic. Nice. It's called drunken fighting. Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan. One of the guards tackles Bond into the pit, and the dragon immediately joins the chat. <laughs> I like that. Bond fights with the big guard, played by the winner of the best name award, Tank Dong. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> His name is Tank Dong. <laughs> I was wondering about that because you didn't have it in the cast. I was like, no funniest name this time. But here we are. Tank Dong. Never change your name, Mr. Dong. It's nuts. Tank Dong flips Bond into some type of running tombstone body slam. He grabs Bond's gun, but doesn't have Bond's palm coating, so Bond just stands there and lets the dragon sneak up on Tank Dong. <laughs> okay, so in Bond's defense, he did try to point out the Komodo dragon before he was body flipped, and then after he was body flipped, he's like, eh, fuck it. Fuck you for that tombstone running body slam. I know, that was some straight dope-ass wrestler move right there. That was actually really cool, dude. <laughs> it marked. was. It was like, wah, 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 wah. I would like to see a wrestler use that as his finisher. Yeah, right? Bond says, good luck with that. As Dong clicks the gun over and over, when the dragon pulls Dong's leg out from underneath him and drags him away, a full-grown human could escape a Komodo dragon, but whatever. <laughs> Another dragon joins the snack, and Bond leaps off of its back to grab the bridge. As he pulls his head up, another guard draws on him, when Eve stabs her stiletto into the man's wrist and kicks him out. She holds the case for Bond, who says, put it all on red. Hmm. So, if I'm not mistaken, Eve is now a millionaire? It's not accounted for. Like, here's four million pounds. Right. That's exactly right. That's unaccounted for four million pounds cash. I'm sorry, euros. Yeah, euros. Even more. Yeah, right. So, I guess Eve's a millionaire now? Eve's a millionaire. Why is she even still working at MI6? Why are you a secretary? I have no idea. I would immediately quit my job. Like, eh. Uh, I just won the lottery. I'm out. <laughs> Cutting to the harbor, we see the bad guy's yacht, the Chimera, is actually the Regina, 
built in 2011 by Prove Yachting in Turkey. In the main cabin, Severine waits, with chilled bubbly and in a nighty, when the captain knocks to say it's time to cast off. She was pretty expectant. She was confident that he'd be there. Two glasses of bubbly on ice. She smiles, but is disappointed. Cutting to moments later, she's in the shower. It's steamy. The refrain is going off. You know it's sexy time. And it is, as Bond's hand comes into view to pull back the door and join her. What up, traumatized sex slave girl? I'm here to save you, but first, let me stick my dick in it. <laughs> her reaction is so bizarre to me. Is it? Not as a traumatized sex slave, I suppose. I, I suppose anybody could just walk in there, put hands on her, and she'd be like, all right, I guess it's time. And the way she trembles. Right? I get it. At least it was Bond. She was happy for that. They bang, and we cut to London in time to see M and Mallory catch a BBC report on the viral video capturing the execution of one of their operatives. Shit's fucked, and the optics are somehow worse. Three agents have been killed so far, and the PM has ordered an inquiry. Cutting back to the Camara, as it approaches its destination, Bond activates his radio beacon and pockets it. Severine says it's not too late. We could turn back now, as goons cock their weapons behind them, and Bond responds that He's not so sure. No, not certain at all because, you know, they have guns and apparently they all know he's here because he just walks out onto the deck. He's very confident in that radio. That's all I'm saying. He's very confident. If Silva was as smart as he was, why would radio be a thing on his island? He would have sophisticated jamming devices which exist out there. At least, I would. Even though the waters are incredibly calm here for the Pacific, this is supposed to be Hashima Island or Battleship Island here called Dead City Island. This is all going to be shot with a mixture of real shots of the island and pine wood substitutes. Oh, well, they did a fantastic job. The movie's version of Dead City Island was abandoned overnight when the villain hacked the chemical plant to produce a false leak warning. She says he wanted the island, and he took it. He always gets what he wants. This movie is big and verbally fluffing its villain. Well, yeah, well... Once you see him, you'll understand why he's big into fluffing. A zip-tied Bond is shoved into a room as Severine is taken away, also bound. With Bond in some type of server room, center frame, as the lift lowers, with the now familiar blocking. Bond almost smiles as out steps Raul Silva, immortalized by Javier Bardem. He's an ex-MI6 agent, but make no mistake, he has a Spanish name, played by a Spanish actor, and the Latin skulls were no accident. Nope, they are no accident. Hello, James. Welcome. Do you like the island? My grandma had a small island that had become infested with rats from a fishing boat. His grandma buried a baited oil drum for the rats to fall into, and after a month, they'd trapped all the rats, which they ignored and let starve to the point of cannibalism. They ate each other until only two remained, the two survivors. Then, he says you release those two rats on the island, as they no longer eat coconut. They only eat rat. Silva says, look what she made us. Silva exposits he was stationed in Hong Kong from 86 to 97, back when he was M's favorite. And Bond's not nearly the agent he was. He can tell you that. Just look at Bond, barely held together with his pills and his drink. Don't forget my pathetic love of country, Bond adds. And they continue chuckling at each other's posturing. Oh, man. There's a lot of posturing in this, isn't there? I like the way Javier Bardem plays this character. He's very confident, very braggadocious, very swaggy. I really like his Silva. He was menacing in a different kind of way, you know what I'm saying? He was not, like, physically intimidating, but still menacing. It's not that he isn't physically intimidating. He's not a small man. He's not Dave Batista, but he's not Matthew Almerick either. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And the way he acts actually is intimidating. It's like what we talked about before with Bane. It's just he is intimidating. He is so flamboyantly egotistical. He doesn't feel like anything can or even should stop him. Right. And that makes him dangerous because that means he will do anything. Right. Chaotic evil. Silva can't believe Bond can't accept M lies to him, but Bond doesn't believe it. Silva has a hard line on M's computer and tells Bond he didn't score a 70 on his marksman eval. He scored 40. He was also lied to about the shrink clearing him for duty. Medical and physical evals failed. Psych eval 
highlights alcohol and substance addiction, pathological authority issues based on unresolved childhood trauma, not approved for duty, with suspension advised. What is this if not betrayal? She sent you to me, knowing you are not ready, knowing you will likely die. Mommy was very bad. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. A little more lilt. Javier Bardem is one of the greatest actors who ever lived, period. He drips charisma. It's pouring from his mouth, from simple looks. His chigurra is frightening. But I don't see it the way he sees it. He may be right. She might have sent him out Ba down here to die, but that's his fucking job. He has never been on a mission where he's not expected to probably die. I, I don't believe so. You know, you're wrong and he's right on this. As a football player, you expect you can get injured, but they don't send you out there without pads. Okay, so here's the other point I was making. She trusts him enough that if he says he can do the job, she believes in him. I think she just sent him out because it's a Bond movie. <laughs> And in the real world, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> we got to progress the movie along. In the real world, it wouldn't have happened. Oh, no. In the real world, none of this would have happened. Silva unbuttons Bond's shirt and looks at Bond's bullet scars. Look what she's done to you. Well, she's never tied me to a chair. Her loss. He feels Bond's chest, and Bond asks if it's really about him. Silva says, it's about her, you, and me. You see, we're the last two rats. We can either eat each other, hmm, or eat everyone else. Yeah, that little segue, that little hmm. We could eat each other, because this is a real rapey scene. He's like, oh, we could eat each other right now, homie. It sounded like he wanted to do both, is all I'm saying. The homoeroticism here, I feel like you can take multiple ways. Like, maybe Silva is genuinely attracted to Bond. I take Silva as a type of man to where he would go both ways, just from a hedonistic point and not really much of sexual attraction. I just think he likes to fuck holes, essentially. But, like, really what I get out of this is this is more of a power thing. I think he's trying to make Bond uncomfortable. Then the position he's in, he can do whatever he wants to Bond. Right. I think it's also honestly meant to make the audience recoil because most of us are so used to him being, oh, the ultimate ladies, man. And I feel like for a torture scene, you want to make the audience uncomfortable. Like, I think they knew what they were doing there. It's just about the uncomfortableness of the scene, but I think it's mostly a power thing, like you were saying. The way Silva looks and touches on Bond is great here. And Daniel does this micro recoil, like he's adverse to this treatment, but he's trying his best to play it off for now. Silva calls this out, saying Bond's trying to remember his training, but what did they teach him to cover this? Silva rubs Bond's legs and says, well, first time for everything, and Bond cheeses. What makes you think this is my first time? It was totally not Bond's first time. I mean, he did have college days. I'm sure he experimented once or twice. Oh, Mr. Bond, Silva tisks as he stands. All this physical stuff so dull, chasing spies so old-fashioned. Your knees must be killing you. England, Empire, MI6, you're living in a ruin as well. You just don't know it yet. At least here there are no old ladies giving orders and no silly gadgets from those fools in Kew Branch. Silva offers Bond whatever life he wants, to choose his own missions, just name it. Destabilize a nation through the stock market, blip, easy. Interrupt transmissions from spy satellites, bop, done. Rig an election to the highest bidder. Bond offers, or a gas explosion in London. Silva agrees, just a point and a click. Well, everyone needs a hobby. Bond twists, and it does burn Silva. His face drops, and asks Bond what his hobby is then, and Bond says, Resurrection. <laughs> this is the first trailer line that actually fits with the theme of the movie more than just sounding badass on its own. Right. It's a badass line, because you know what? That's his hobby. If you trace the 25-plus movies, you're like, oh yeah, this dude likes to come back from the dead specifically with the theme of rebirth of this movie. Oh, well, yes. With the restraints removed, Bond follows Silva outside to a courtyard area. Charles Trenet's Joy de Vivre Diddy Boom whines over the abandoned PA. In English, boom, when our hearts go boom, everything goes boom with it, and it is love which awakes. I love that song. All of the background music that is played in universe is perfect. Silva explains when the people abandoned this place, they quickly decided what to take and what to leave, giving him a daily reminder of the perspective of importance. Nothing superfluous in his life, 
He disregards things at whim, eliminating redundancy. In the center of the courtyard, Severine is bound in front of a statue and beaten. There's not much left on her face, and how could there be? Death is probably the last thing that this girl has left to look forward to. Ah, this poor baby. She's been used and abused. And the actress really is good at conveying that. By every man, including James Bond, that has come across her. I thought about that. That was my joke. He was like, yeah, hey, traumatized sex slave, I'm here to save you, but first I'm going to abuse you too. Right? He's been used and abused by every man who's come across her. And we're not just making that up for bad jokes like we would. Like, they actually acknowledge that and had her tremble. Right. This is one of the most tragic characters ever in a Bond film. I don't disagree with you, Matthew. Makes me uncomfortable thinking about her. Silva pours two shots of 50-year-old McClellan, a favorite of Bond's. Holy shit, that scotch is as old as the franchise. Well, of course it is. Plug, hello, it's 50-year-old McKellen, it's 50-year-old, 50 years of James Bond. Skyfall was the 50th anniversary of Bond, and it's not by chance that the scotch has a 1962 and giant print on the bottle. <laughs> no, they, they didn't, that wasn't an accident? That wasn't a, like, I thought that was the, the mislabel print, super rare bottle. Silva toasts to the women they loved. Bond shoots his scotch, and Silva walks to Severine. Darling, your lovers are here he says, and Force kisses her. She almost collapses in tears, trembling, but he says, no, 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 stand up straight and keep still, putting the shot glass on her head, William Tell style. Time to redeem your marksmanship scores. He hands Bond a beautiful old single-load dueling pistol, while a goon puts a gun to the back of Bond's head. Just to be sporting, Silva will let Bond go first. This scene is amazing. The song ends and everything goes quiet. You hear the wind blowing. Bond's hand shakes slightly, and after a second of nothing, Silva says, Did you really die that day? Is there anything left of the old 007? Bond fires wide right and clips the statue. Silva says, My turn, and straight shoots Severine in the chest, killing her. I win. What do you say to that? Bond's pissed. He shakes his head and says, It was a waste of good scotch and then swings his gun into the arm of the man behind him, which causes another goon to get shot accidentally. Controlling the gun arm now, he flips around, and Gun Fu shoots everyone before jumping up and turning on Silva. Now, this fight was really quick, but it was amazing, and very John Wick again before John Wick. This scene was pretty dope. The only reason Severine died is because Bond had to waste his shot. They've already established he's not confident. His hand shakes. If he was the old Bond, he'd have blasted that glass right off her head. Yada, yada. We move on. But in this scene, Bond knows he has to waste his shot so Silva can take his shot because Silva's the only one close enough to shoot him if he controls the gun arm of the bad guy. And if you follow the scene, Bond establishes this as he's taking his shot. He looks around at every one of those guys and gets their position. It's it's a well-executed stunt scene. Well thought out. What are you going to do? Take me back to her? On your own? Who says I'm on my own? As three Augusta Westland wildcats roar overhead, the Bond theme strikes up and Bond holds out his homing beacon saying, Latest thing from Q Brunch. A radio. I like that line because Q seems to get simpler in these movies as we go along and Bond kind of mocks him when he gives him the radio. Silva mocks Q and them for being archaic and look at all he can do. And then Bond takes him down with a radio. Q branch. Yep. Brilliant. It is. It is pretty brilliant. We cut to M in the underground MI6, walking around a corner, center framed, before showing Silva in his cell, center framed. Just know 90% of the movie's blocking is center framed. 90%? 99. Yeah, there you go. Until... Scotland. Everything's pretty much center frame until you get to Scotland. In the prison cell, M and Bond confront Silva. Silva tells M she's smaller than he remembers. She twists she barely remembers him at all. No remorse, just as he imagined. But regret is unprofessional. They kept him for five months in a room with no air. They tortured him, and he protected her secrets. He protected her while he suffered and suffered. But then he realized 
It was M who betrayed him, leaving him with nothing but a cyanide capsule in his back left molar. He broke the tooth and bit into the capsule, and it burned his insides, but Silva didn't die. He told himself that he'd survive to kill M. And with the way he's talking, I'd be starting to worry about how easy it was to catch him, actually. I don't know if they haven't learned over the course of catching bad guys, but it seems like every time they do, it's part of their plan. I was thinking that when they were walking up to him in prison, I was like, why is he in the building? Why did you not take him to, like, a secure black site where nobody knows You know what I'm saying? In America, we don't take our fucking top CIA prisoners to goddamn the White House to waterboard them. We take them to Guantanamo Bay. Yes, yes. It was a real bizarre turn of events. Why do you? Why do we always lock the bad guys? It's it's a horrible trope, and it's starting to get old with it. Like, oh, it was his plan all the time to get locked up. Although Heath Ledger did it the best. But, you know, still old. Silva, to prove a point, pulls out his false teeth and jaw brace. His mouth is rotten, his left cheekbone gone. Look on your work, mother, he beckons. I have no idea why they had to ruin Blofeld by making him Bond's brother in the next movie when they already did this, albeit spiritually, with Silva. Yeah, the the whole brother, right, no, I get it, I get it. And doing, making Bond and Blofeld literal brothers was stupid. Walking away, M orders Tanner to have Silva's computer analyzed to see who he's given the list to and anything else he's done. She then turns to Bond and says, His name is Tiago Rodriguez. He was a brilliant agent, but he operated beyond his briefs, hacking the Chinese. The Hong Kong handover was coming up, and they wanted Silva's head. So she gave him up for six other captured agents and a peaceful transition. Yeah, that's a hard choice. But he did fuck up. And if you're not following orders... And he was caught hacking the Chinese government by the Chinese government. By the Chinese government. Yeah, at that point, you almost had to hand him over. At least they got six other agents for it. Right. Still a hard choice. M leaps for her inquiry, and Q sets to unlocking Silva's laptop. This scene is dumb. Q is a fucking moron for connecting this guy's laptop to their network. (laughs) But he does, and starts decrypting, which is some super encryption only six people in the world could get past, but of course this 15-year-old invented them. I hate the new Q, honestly, and he only gets worse. Ben Wishaw is okay in this film, But he really didn't like playing in this series, didn't want to continue, and it shows after this film. I get taken out of the scenes by how much it feels like this actor doesn't want to be there. I hate it. Uh, He is definitely not my favorite Q. Also, a little bit of an Easter egg. The visual effect of the encryption algorithm when they're decrypting it, that is a version of what Jarvis looked like when you get to Age of Ultron. This definitely came first, but they're almost identical. I mean, it was probably the same effects studio that made both You're of them. Right. Probably the same effects studio that made both of them, yeah. Oh, by the way, he clicks one button, and they're in, of course. Well, it wasn't just one button they were in. It's Bond had that info brag of, like, looking at that six letters and be like, hey, put that together there. Oh, yeah, that train station underground. So Q pokes around. Meanwhile, we cut to M as the inquiry starts. By the way, random, I know, but Mike Wilson's cameo for this film was cut, so stop looking for him. Okay. I never do look for him, and it always surprises me every time. M says she caught the guy, but the board is more concerned with the massive cock-ups that led them here. Cutting back to Bond, when he and Q crack Silva's system, and immediately all of mi six computerized systems are overridden. Every motorized door starts opening, including the one holding Silva, which he was waiting for. Bond darts off, and Q sets to stopping the security breach. Q turns center frame and says, Can someone tell me how the hell he got into our system? As he looks at Silva's laptop that shows a splash screen with a skull, saying, Not such a clever boy. Now, I'm sure in Q's defense he had some sort of firewall protection he thought would work. I'm sorry, but that was incredibly dumb. I'm just going to take this guy's laptop, the guy who already hacked into our system, by the way, and I'm going to trust my firewall. (laughs) <laughs> right and we're gonna bring him in here too oh god yeah yeah no one yeah. thought that out because if they did nobody would have brought him anywhere near that computer go to guantanamo bay and get waterboarded fucker <laughs> fucker and then we plugged it in even if q plugged it in all the doors would have opened and they just would have looked at each other like what the fuck what the fuck 
Right? Exactly. Your plan doesn't work. Q immediately unplugs the laptop from the network, but damage is done, and Bond only finds the guards' bodies. I love how Bond's reflection is shown here in the pod. They did the mirror thing with the allies last time, and the villain here is the old evil reflection of Bond trope. So they better not pull this shit again in the next moot. Wait. <laughs> he follows Silva further underground through a trap door opened on the floor. Bond moves through the tunnels as Q guides him to a door. Bond says it won't open, and they have an amusing tiff. But there's a train coming to squish Bond. So he shoots the door locks and shoulders the door open just in time. In the subway station, Silva passes some goons dressed as cops who give him a bundle as they pass. Bond tries to swim through the tube crowd, and dude better wash his hands after this. Just touching on everyone like that is how you get the flu. Silly. Bond begs Q to focus on finding Silva and asks if he should get on the train. Q says he saw a suspicious person get on the train that's now leaving, but then says, don't get on. Give us a minute, as Q checks out the suspicious person and yep at Silva. <laughs> Even Bond rolls his eyes at this. Right, everybody rolls their eyes at this. Bond takes off after the leaving train. He dives for the rear engine, barely catching it as a commuter quips that he's keen to get home. <laughs> Bond, meanwhile, is looking at the rear engineer with a duh face saying, open the door, please. <laughs> when she does, he says, health and safety, carry on. Which she does. If I were to jump on a train and try to enter through <laughs> the conductor's car, I'm pretty sure I'd be arrested. No, I wouldn't question him either. No? Dude, looks like he can fold me in half, and he just literally, like, dove for my speeding train. <laughs> and he's wearing fucking Armani. This is, just, like, I, I would definitely let him go by. I'm like, I'm not gonna try to stop him or anything, but I'm definitely calling the cops. Oh, as soon as she picked her jaw up, she probably called the cops. <laughs> Bond moves through the train. As Q informs him, Silva is disguised as a cop. Bond realizes Silva's going for M, and has Q warn them. But M can't go anywhere. M is very defiant in the face of this Senate hearing. I'm not showing my back to this woman. In the meantime, the whole point for her case that she is trying to make is coming there now. I would have stood up and said, Madam, we have credible intelligence that we are about to be attacked in this very chamber. Whenever she even went to say anything or even think about it, get her thoughts together, she was immediately talked down. Really to. shut down. Immediately shut down. To the point where Mallory had to step in and say some shit. So screw it. She just has to trust Bond like she always has been. Mm. Meanwhile, Bond and Silva lock eyes at the next stop, and Silva takes off with Bond in pursuit, the music befitting a foot chase. And the chase is exciting, too. Running, jumping, sliding through rush hour tube traffic. But Bond loses Silva in a gaggle of cops called to the area by Q, which is honestly smart. You know the cops will come. Why not use it against them? But Bond spots the ajar service door Silva used. He chases Silva and fires at the man as he climbs up a ladder. Silva stops. Whoa, not bad. Not bad, James. For a physical wreck, you caught me. Now here's your prize. The latest thing from my local toy store. It's called... Radio. Silva detonates a hole above them, but under the tube lines, which was meant to roadblock Bond. But now, he hopes he can just crush him. But before all that, Bond just dusts that he hopes it wasn't planning to blast him. Silva laughs as a train he programmed to follow him out rushes into the hole and crashes into the area dramatically, barely missing Bond and creating his roadblock. This is the most convoluted aspect of his entire plan but if we're honest and think back, it's been much, much worse. Almost all of that chase, by the way, was shot mostly at Caring Cross with some Pinewood inserts. Silva just threw a train at Bond. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah, he did. He just threw a train at the dude. Well, he thought he had a little bit more time in between them, so screw it. Why not throw it at him? Why not throw it at him? Right, exactly. <laughs> like in a foot chase in movies where they dump trash cans and stuff behind him. Mm hmm. If the person's close enough, they're just going to get hit with a trash can. Right. On the surface, Silva exits, as planned, to his pickup police car. His goons arm him, and they drive to Westminster. All the while, we hear and eventually cut to M giving her passionate movie speech defense. Oh, yeah, the movie speech. With Tanner sweating bricks, knowing he has to get her out of there five minutes ago. 
Silva, meanwhile, has infiltrated Trinity House and is killing everyone on his way to M, who's quoting Tennyson to her oversight board. Bond is running through the chaotic streets to get there on foot. The music rises. The poem ends. Silva bursts in, guns blazing on anyone who moves too quickly, and Mallory leaps into action. Our boy jumps that dais like that dude did last week. I was very proud. M freezes, Silva smiles, and Mallory rips M down and takes her bullet. This man is a G, a fucking G. Oh, super G. I think Ray Fiennes would have made a genuinely fine James Bond. Silva lights the place up, enraged. Tanner ducks M under the table. Bond makes his way to the fight and kicks a gun to Eve. Mallory takes another down guard's gun, and the three make a stand. This is actually much better than I remembered. This should make War Brother like Bond between these three moving forward. Right? This was a, w a little bit better than I remembered, except for the convenient placing of all the guns. If it was convenient, they wouldn't have had to, like, leave cover to crawl across the room for one or have one kicked by Bond. I mean, it, was, it wasn't the most inconvenient, but it wasn't the most convenient ever. It wasn't super convenient. Mallory did have to leave cover for his. They didn't fall into their hands. Like I have seen in some movies. I have seen that in some movies, <laughs> yes. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Bond shoots the fire extinguishers to make a smoke screen and a total Bond moment that proves he may have started out a blunt hammer, but he's becoming surgical. He is becoming surgical. Just took me right back to the Roger Moore days because I was like, what the fuck kind of fire extinguishers are those? Carbon dioxide. I was the opposite of you. For me, it took me back to the days of playing Agent Under Fire and shit like that on the PlayStation 2. When you get those cool Bond moment tags. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that. Yes. Bond casually walks out firing. Silva loses his shit and shoots a random dude before leaving. Eve evacuates the suits, who I think got the point. So convenient that I would have thought it staged. <laughs> I'm sure the conspiracy theorists were all over the web the next day. MI6 pulls false flag operation to secure more funding. <laughs> exactly. Silva escapes in his cop car and Bond hijacks M's Jaguar and M. Bond tells him they've been a step behind Silva from the start. Now he can follow them if he wants her. Bond tells Q to leave a trail of breadcrumbs for Silva, and we cut to later at Dead Bond's property garage. He has to switch cars as her company vehicle will have trackers for the government to find them and ruin their plan. So he opens the garage door to a 1964 Aston Martin DB5. And M says, oh yes, that's totally inconspicuous. <laughs> so you'll be taking the Lamborghini then, Mr. Wayne. Bond just quotes Cammy. Get in. <laughs> Little callback to Quantum of Solace. Callback to yes. Uh, uh, get in. The Bond theme strikes, the car roars, and they're off. Fan service bliss. Also, it's shot at Parkside Industrial Estate. Mmm, I just love that car. It's reserved such a place in the cultural zeitgeist. zeitgeist. Yeah. Yeah. And I would hazard to say it is the Atlas of Aston Martin. If it weren't for James Bond, I don't think they'd still be around too much. M complains about the car's ride, and Bond pops the cover over the classic ejector gadget, asking if she's to complain the whole way. She calls his bluff, but it's just another audience pop moment, and it too worked. That was funny. That was a cute moment. She asks where they're going, and he says, back in time, to where we'll have the advantage. He's like, we're getting off the grid. Cutting back to Tanner and Q, leaving the trail for Silva, when Mallory walks up behind them, catching them in the act. Just when the two think they're fucked, Mallory says, good plan, isolate him. Instead, though, take him up this more monitored route, and we can watch him the whole way. Q shivers, what if the Prime Minister finds out? And Mallory smiles, well, then we're all buggered. Mallory went from... I don't trust this guy to, oh, this guy's the G in fewer scenes than it would necessarily have taken. I don't know about that. I think he immediately, like, knew from his files and had a respect for him. The way he even talked to him in the beginning, it comes off adversarial. But once you know better, if you go back again, it's actually really not. It's almost more out of respect. He didn't stop him. No, he didn't stop he him. He, too, has that same reverence that M already has just from his past mission. He just says, hey, it's a young man's game. There's no harm bowing out. You don't have to go kill yourself for us. Right, yeah. You've done so much. That's the way I get that, going back and watching it again. I like it. That's how I'll take it. Less adversarial, more like, come on, man. 
He's written really well to where the first time you're like, oh, and then when you go back and watch it again, it's like he's really not the entire time, not even with them in the beginning. He even points that out, and you just think he's being an asshole, but he's not. But he's not. He's just doing his job. Cut to the next morning. M wakes in the Aston and joins Bond, standing by a road in a valley covered in fog. In the penultimate Bond novel, You Only Live Twice, written in 1964, after Sean Connery had so successfully established the character, author Ian Fleming gave Bond a Scottish backstory, with his father hailing from Glencoe. Now this is the place which Bond has come to draw Silva out. It's a suitably breathtaking locale, previously seen on screen in Braveheart and Highlander. Bond's childhood home itself, though, along with the chapel and entrance gate, was constructed on Hankley Common in Surrey, which had previously appeared in two Pierce Brosnan Bond films, The World Is Not Enough, where it stands in for the oil fields of Azerbaijan, and Die Another Day. Huh, very interesting. I could practically smell this scene when he steps out of the car with the birds chirping, and the fog and the moss and everything. It was very well shot. It was a good scene. And nothing was in the middle. Uh, but that's because we have two lead protagonists now. Yes. Bond pauses beneath the misty peaks of Puki Etive Moor and before Puki Etive Beg. He summons all of his internal strength as him asks how old he was when his parents died. He grinds that she knows the answer to that. You know the whole story. I almost used this scene for the poster as well. It's amazingly representative of the entire movie with great blocking. And why does M keep asking Bond stupid questions she already knows the answers to? She's scared. I think M knows that she's come here to die. Well, she's being used as bait, so she knows there's a good chance she's going to die. I think she knows instinctively, like, this is the end of her road. Everything's been falling apart for her. Even if she does come out of this alive, nothing's going to be the same for her. Well, she's done as M, right, yeah. M says orphans always made the best recruits. And Bond says, storm's coming. And we cut to a mini montage of them driving along the A82, eventually pulling into Skyfall Manor. The stag represents a lot symbolically to man, but here it specifically represents rebirth, the overall main theme of the film, echoed by dialogue and highlighted by events, and even the villain from a time before Bond, who's adapted beyond him. Changing of the guard, rebirth. I love how meta it is, too, because it's kind of a commentary of how Craig gave a new life to the franchise and how the, like, the reboot was a rebirth for Bond instead of doing the same movie again with someone else. Right. The name Skyfall, though, being slightly more on the nose, but nonetheless brilliant, of being the end of the world for Bond. For a man who goes everywhere and does anything, this is the last place he ever thought he'd go to again. Inside the manor, they look around at the abandoned but mostly looked after place. It isn't falling apart, but it's close. A man named Kincaid, played by Albert Finney, greets them with a double barrel before realizing Bond is Bond and then happily greets him as if an old friend. He hears M as Emma too. It's cute. Yeah. The gatekeeper here was originally meant to be Sean Connery, but the director was an idiot and got a say in the matter, thinking that it would detract from the scene. But honestly, when I first saw this, I was wondering if this guy should have been more important. Like, who is he to Bond? And if we're just throwing him in, then make him matter more to me. Yeah, I guess Sean Connery could have played that part. That would have been perfect. The old groundskeeper. Kincaid asks what Bond's doing there. And Bond says some men are coming to kill them. But he's going to kill them first. The house has been sold in Bond's death, along with valuable possessions, such as all the fucking guns, (laughs) leaving only an old hunting rifle and Kincaid's shotgun. The rifle has the initials A.B. engraved in the stock. Kincaid says there may be some sticks of dynamite left in the old quarry, but if all else fails, sometimes the old ways are the best ways. And he puts a knife on the table. Does Kincaid strike you kind of in that moment as a potential serial killer? I just think Kincaid killed some Nazis. (laughs) At least. Cutting outside, Bond sets up for target practice, and Kincaid asks who they're fighting. Bond says it's not Kincaid's fight, and Kincaid says... Try and stop me, you hopped up little shit. Kincaid offers some advice in a way that shows he taught Bond how to shoot a little bit when Bond was a kid. Bond then smokes some china from a hundred yards out in half a second, and Kincaid just slack jaws. (laughs) What did you say you did for a living? 
<laughs> Funny joke aside, this is where you let him know he's up against a highly trained army and give him another thought at it. Yeah, definitely. I'm a professional killer. There's a team of professional killers coming here. You could stick around if you want. You're probably gonna die. You're probably gonna <laughs> die, dude. Like, stuff your pride. Get out of here. <laughs> Look at me. Do you see what I just did? And I came out here to make a stand. This isn't good. I get it. You're a brash, confident old man. You're brave. God bless you. Get the fuck out of here right now. <laughs> you kill deer. They kill people. <laughs> they kill people. Cutting to M upstairs, staring at the gateway as if awaiting the reaper himself as Kincaid approaches. Emma, I brought your blankets. The nights get cold here. He shows her a hidden priest hole that leads from the house to the old chapel while half flirting with her. Kincaid has adopted a surrogate father role here, and M, of course, is the mom. So it's really nice that they're getting along. I was about to say, is Albert Finney flirting with Judy Dench right there? It's like, I want to take you down here in this murder cave and I'll show you around. It puts the lotion in. <laughs> Cue the Home Alone trap setting montage. M makes a shotgun shell chandelier with ziplocks of shrapnel. Bond places shells over nails underneath floorboards to go off when stepped on. They board the place up, move a mirror, grab some TNT, and saw off the shotgun. Then they post it up to shelter the storm. You're right. It was a very decent Home Alone montage. I don't have any problems with the scene. Especially knowing what it represents. Yeah, it's fine. Cutting inside, and I notice we've been getting varied blocking since the movie started focusing on the pair at once. Bond rising to the challenge here is powerful to me, whilst M wallows in failure. Bond tells her she did her job, and that he read her obit of him, which she actually rises for critique of. Bond responds, appalling. But the part where she called him an example of British fortitude was all right. <laughs> Just then, dogs start barking, and they ready themselves. At the gates, a platoon of goons advance on the manor. Slowly, and under no cover. And call me crazy, but they have a hunting rifle in God aim, don't they? <laughs> you could have pinned them down out there. He could have popped them all off before they even got to him. Bond's not a sniper. He likes to do it up close and personal so he can look you in the eyes. <laughs> he likes to feel it. I want to see the light leave their eye. <laughs> right? The goons move in front of the Aston and to the main door to plant a charge. When, surprise, motherfucker, Bond pops up in the driver's seat and hits the minigun switch, and every goon in his path gets it from knees to dick. They only wished it was headshots, and some of them just fall in the bullets to be put out of their misery. <laughs> are, you, are you saying you're pretty sure one guy just pulled out his pistol and shot himself after? I would have. I just got like eight bullets in my dick. I don't even have balls anymore. I'm shooting myself. Man, you win. Congratulations. I'm rage quitting. The entire game of life. Right. The goons light up the Aston and dive into the shed where Kincaid pulls the Jurassic Park switcheroo with the mirror, then blasts them with his shoddy. Welcome to Scotland, motherfucker. Should have hit him with a claymore. More goons move in and one suffers the floor trap. M sets off the improvised explosive chandelier, killing some goons. Bond steps out with the rifle and fires his way to the house. Kincaid is pinned down and dropping his reload when Bond saves him at the last second. M says, hold my beer, and gets into a gunfight and drops her entire gun for Bond to save her. <laughs> I don't even know why she was in the house. Like, put her ass in the cave. Why aren't y'all hiding in the fucking cave? Burn down the chapel. Before Silva gets there, hide in the cave. You're right. You got your booby traps. Put her in the cave. Then, boom, boom, by the animals, blares over the night, emitted from giant speakers dangling beneath Silva's arriving Augusta Westland EH-101. This song is his grand entrance. Boom, boom. His intimidation tactic. But it also harkens back to the song on the island and Silva's challenge to Bond's masculinity. As I was saying, the diegetic music in this is perfect. Boom, boom. I love it. I'm rolling up on my air support, bitches. Bond sends the parents to the kitchen and knocks out some window boards to fire at the chopper, which returns the favor, lighting up the manor with a 50 cal. And if the place wasn't condemned before, it is now. <laughs> I didn't think this was the brightest move either. I would have let the chopper land. 
He has fucking amps from Metallica's tour hanging from that thing. You don't think he's got a gun? Probably got rockets. Why would you highlight your position like that? Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Bond is pretty much pinned down as the place turns to Swiss cheese. He sends Kincaid and M to the chapel through the tunnel as Silva lands outside with another platoon of men. Silva tosses incendiary grenades into the manor that explode into raging infernos while Bond lifts weapons from the dead. Silva taunts and tosses more fire nades. Bond spots a propane tank and remembering Casino Royale gets an idea. But first, we cut to M being led by Kincaid through the tunnel when we notice that she's been hit and is bleeding out. I like the fact that Silva is smart enough to not fuck around. He sends a 12-man hit squad to soften Bond up, knowing full well that these guys probably weren't going to make it. And then, there's at least eight more guys getting off that helicopter with him. They don't even go in the house. He just starts chucking grenades through the window. I even thought about that in the movie. I was just like, that took y'all everything to get rid of the last crew, and here's another one now. Yep. Bond grabs the tanks and some dynamite. Silva has the chopper destroy Bond's Aston. That was just mean. He did that shit out of spite. And now he has to die. Yeah, see, that's the point where it's like, Bond was watching that out the window, and I was like, everything up until that moment was business. And as soon as that Aston blew up, the look on his face changed. It really did, dude. They highlighted a look on his face. He was like, that's it, motherfucker. That's it. I, I could take everything else, right? But you just blew up my Aston? Are you high? Fucking prick. Right? Bond lights the fuse on some dynamite on some tanks and ducks into the priest hole saying, I always hated this place. As Bond races through the tunnel, the house explodes and takes out most of the goons and the chopper, which also crashes into the house conveniently, causing the entire manor to explode. Silva is in shock. He desperately tries to regroup his thoughts when he sees M and Kincaid in the field after surfacing from the tunnel. They're using a flashlight, easily seen at night, even though they're hiding and everything is glowing this brilliant orange. Right. Let's use the flashlight, dumbasses. That was another thing that bothered me. M is a trained professional spy. Kincaid isn't, though. She would know better. Turn that bloody light off, you're going to get us both killed. She would know better. Silva sends his last two goons after Bond, and he limps off after M. For me, the electric guitar is a little too heavy here. But the imagery is amazing, as always, in this movie. A feast for the eyes. I like the score. All of it. I thought it was very good. Bond surfaces, running full sprint at a goon in the field when he jumps from a fallen tree to kick the goon in the face, ending the man. Or at least knocking him out. Bond then runs into and across the massively frozen pond between him and the chapel until Silva shoots at him. You see what comes of all this running around, Mr. Bond? It's exhausting. The last goon comes behind Bond. Silva looks at the chapel and says, Mother's calling. I'll give her a goodbye kiss for you. Bond grabs the goon's gun and spins as the goon fires, shooting out the ice beneath them. And dude, how deep is this thing? Right? This is not a pond. This is a lock. This thing goes all the way down. They trade attempts to strangle each other. Underwater. Right? But as silly as it sounds, they're actually trying to knock each other out in seconds by cutting off the heart's ability to pump what oxygen it has to the brain. Which Bond does and swims up. But where's the hole? Panic music mode. But Bond lights a flare that illuminates the hole and swims up. Having been through the trials of fire and ice, what is left after this cremation and baptism is Bond, distilled to the purest form. Nothing weak or even petty remains anymore for this Bond. This is literally Bond the White. Bond the White. <laughs> Cut to Silva, finding the tombstone for Andrew Bond, A.B., and Monique Delacroix Bond. So for the millionth time, Bond isn't a code name. Fuck off. I'm sorry if you like the theory. It's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. His name is James Bond. That's his name. His parents' names were Bond. His parents' names were Bond, and I know it's stupid for a secret agent to use his real name everywhere he goes, but that's how James Bond does his job. It's stupid, and we love making that joke, but it's also kind of a Silva level power play that Bond goes around using his real name. It's such cocky confidence that it's insane, and it's intimidating because of it. Right. It's powerful. I get that. I haven't really before, but like analyzing Silva and looking back through that reflection at Bond, I get, I get it now. 
it is dumb, but I can get the powerfulness of it. Right. It's definitely an arrogance thing. Silva goes into the chapel and says, it had to be this way. He fires next to Kincaid and says, please, don't. He grabs M and feigns concern for her wound, spitefully showing her what care, what remorse should have looked like before putting his gun to her face. But then he puts the gun in her hand and forces her hand to her head while he places his head next to hers, saying, free us both. But Bond throws Kincaid's knife into the back of Silva. Because we got to get that conflicting old ways message in again for our film about rebirth. (laughs) But I get it. Learning new tricks doesn't necessarily mean forget the old ones. That's right. Silva screams out in pain. He seems more annoyed Bond's still alive than concerned about his own wound. He is both. He's concerned about the wound and very annoyed that Bond is still alive. But he only gets a few steps further before falling to his knees. As Bond brags, last rat standing. Javier Bardem did such a wonderful job in this death scene. He was pissed off Bond was alive. He was mad because he was stabbed. He was upset he didn't have quite enough strength to put his hands around his throat. Silva falls. Bond quips about getting into deep water, and M collapses into Bond's arms. She says, I suppose it's too late to make a run for it. And Bond says, he's game if she is. But they both know she's dying. She looks at Bond, and with her last words, admits, Well, I did get one thing right. You literally hear her death rattle, her last final exhalation. Bond sheds a tear, covers her eyes, and kisses her forehead. Deep, somber, heavy shrink pulls set the tone as the camera pulls away from Bond, cradling him. But after two bars, the tone brightens, renewed. I'm mad they didn't give Emma a funeral scene. We cut to London and find Bond atop a ministry building offering fantastic views along Whitehall to the Houses of Parliament. This was filmed on the roof of the Department of Energy and Climate Change. The dome towers alongside are those of the old war office building, which itself appeared as the MI6 headquarters in a view to a kill, octopusy, and license to kill. They really like reusing buildings, but I don't blame them. Sets are expensive. They didn't reuse a building so much as just captured one they used to use in the background. Well, there you go. Bond mourns in the view. When Eve comes up behind him, I thought you were going back on active service, Bond queries. Eve says she declined, admitting fieldwork isn't for everyone. Bond quips he feels a lot safer. As well he should. She shot him. I'm not forgiving that. (laughs) Eve says M's will was read, and she left Bond something giving him a small box. Bond opens it to find the porcelain British bulldog. Davy Boy would be so proud. (laughs) Bond thanks her, and we cut to them entering the traditional M office. Bond says they've never been formally introduced, and Eve says her last name is Moneypenny. Bond says he's looking forward to their time together, and she says she's sure they'll have a few more close shaves. But um, bump. Just then, the door opens, and Tanner calls Bond in to see the new M. Gareth Mallory. Bond asks how the arm is, and M says better. There's a painting of Voxel Cross behind him, signifying they've moved on from the building. Yes. M quips about Bond's preconceived notions of his experiences, and then drops a dossier on the desk. 007, top secret. So, 007, are you ready to get back to work? Bond says, with pleasure, M. Behind them, on the sidewall, is Thomas Buttersworth, no relation to the syrup, HMS Victory, heavily engaged in the Battle of Trafalgar. Skyfall is full of flag-waving British pride. It's Bond as a British icon, established for 50 years. Just as Turner's The Fighting Temeraire was voted the nation's favorite painting, Bond is the nation's favorite spy, and in this case, overcoming the baddie, Spanish Silva. The Battle of Trafalgar is the quintessential British victory with Britain's greatest admiral, Horatio Nelson, overcoming the Franco-Spanish fleet by means of crafty maneuvers and splitting them up to pick them off one by one. Bond may initially be likened to the Temeraire being towed to the scrapyard, but like I said, that's M. And by the end, when he receives his new orders, the story arc is such that Bond has been reborn, rejuvenated. But this painting is specifically telling you how to interpret the battle at Skyfall. It's actually the Battle of Trafalgar where against the odds, resourcefulness, and unconventional tactics led to a great British victory over the Spanish. 
suggesting Ilm is a Nelson figure, with her parallels to Nelson being from mortally wounded but living long enough to hear the day was won, to even down to the kiss on her forehead by her trusted companion. But perhaps the most interesting parallel is that when Nelson led HMS Victory to engage the enemy at the Battle of Trafalgar, right behind him was the Temeraire. But in the painting, we see it in its youthful heyday here, rejuvenated, reborn, back in the thick of action, literally right behind British victory. Of course, the reason that there's paintings of ships and sea references at all in M's office is a reference to Dr. No in 1962. One of the many references to that and other films, but that one got constant nods in this movie. Well, yeah, it was the first one. Of course it got constant nods. I digress. The Bond theme strikes up again, and the dots roll out. And we get our gun barrel and the 50-year logo. Roll credits. Good movie overall. I was a little hard on this movie in the first act, but that's by far where it's weakest. Where the last movie failed only in editing, this was a failure of directing. Everyone else was on point, and Purvis and Wade craft amazing, intelligent stories. But every bad choice in production was the director's, and he seemed obsessed with walking back progress this iteration of Bond has made. Every flaw I pretty much had with this movie is a director's choice. Could be the fact he's never done a James Bond before. Different style for him, for sure, at that point. Uh, at that point, for sure, different style for him. He's got some vision. 1917 was great. But mostly, my God, man, not everything has to be center-framed. I know the cinematographer <laughs> fought you over this. It was cool for a minute and then overdone. <laughs> I know he at least made mention. But the movie does go hard in Act 2, and it never turns back, and it's deeper than even I remembered. Visually, it's probably the most stunning of the franchise, and the action is great and actually followable. Yeah, no, the stunt and the special effects were really well done in this movie. I'm giving this movie a solid A. The story is great and emotionally connected while still having stakes. The action, the visuals, the locations, the music, the acting, everything was great. I love the villain. I don't find his plan to be the fifth most convoluted in the series so far even, so who cares? But the first act was noticeably weaker than the last two films. Plot points are telegraphed, and the directing got old fast. I am going to give this movie an A-. minus. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot more than I remember enjoying it the first time. It's a lot more fun than I remember it being. It really was. And I gotta credit that to Javier Bardem's bad guy. He's pretty nefarious. I liked it. For the kill count, how many do you think Bond kills? 18. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with 18. Dude, you almost had, uh, I could have done the confetti again, because you were saying 17, and it is 17. Is it 17? Damn it. It is. You almost it. had it. Trust your gut. <laughs> 23 others die by other means for a total of 40. For the pre-title, the pre-title was awesome. It's fun, funny, fast-paced. It's intense spectacle after intense spectacle. This isn't Roger standing on a green screen rig in one major stunt. This is ripping a digger through a train to dive through it as it rips away, then fight on the train and get shot off of it. In a word, iconic. In three, iconic as fuck. It starts the movie off with a literal bang and introduces Money Penny, second place. Just based on where I'm at on my ranking, and I wanted to rank this pre-title a little bit higher, but all the movies I have above it, I like the pre-titles just a little bit more. And it was really rough. It was hard to rank it where I put it, but I'm going to give this one a fourth place. For the title sequence, the song is one of, if not the best song of all time, depending on taste. The titles are thematic and well-made, with Bond being pulled through a hole in the riverbed, from drowning to rebirth, weapons that form headstones, and staghorns forming similar shapes, all befitting the death and rebirth thing. While I do personally think that visually the title sequence of Quantum of Solace was better, the song is so much better in this that since I have to grade them together as they're part of the same sequence, this gets first place. Wow. You really like the song. Yeah, it's a great song. Yeah. I really enjoyed this title sequence. I thought it was well done, and I like the song. It's good. So, fourth place. Money Penny Pickup Like 
Hey, we actually got one, and they made up for lost time with constant flirting. But I'll go with his first and true sign that he liked her, at least a little. And that's when she knocked off the mirror and he teased, you aren't using it anyway. Fifth place. I gave it eighth place. There are more flirty interactions other than the shaving scene and everything like that in other movies that I enjoyed better. Q gadgets. A Walther coated to Bond's palm and a radio beacon. And yet, aware of the paltry amount of gadgets on display, they leaned into it, joking about how ridiculous the gadgets got, and still finding a way to make them seem mission critical. Tenth place. Well, we are going to completely agree that Q goes in the tenth place here, for pretty much the same reasons. I enjoy the simplicity of the gadgets, and Q did his job. Tenth place. Cars, the Aston Martin DB5, meant to be just like the Goldfinger one in complete fan service, but it works, and it's great, and the whole theater popped second place. I gave it fourth place. I know it's the DB5, but it didn't do that much, except at the very end, and then they blew it up, and it broke my heart. Main ally, Eve Moneypenny, a capable but green agent who makes a huge rookie mistake that leads her to a permanent desk job. This version is awesome, but constantly shat on to telegraph her career change. She's more of a hindrance in the opening, she shoots him for God's sake, and is the reason Patrice gets the list out. And she only ever helps again during the attack on Trinity House, but still more than Kincaid did with longer screen presence, so 25th place. (laughs) I I had her up a little bit higher, because she did help out in Macau as well. So, I gave her 15th place. Villains. Raul Silva, real name Tiago Rodriguez, former MI6 specialist in cyberterrorism at Station H, Hong Kong, before China took control in 1997. When he ignored orders and hacked into the Chinese government's top secret files, M allowed them to take him prisoner. He was tortured until finally he attempted suicide by swallowing a cyanide capsule hidden in a false tooth but survived then left disfigured with a misshapen jaw, rotted teeth, and a sunken left eye socket. He wears a dental prosthetic to conceal his disfigurements. At some point, he escaped from Chinese custody and reinvented himself as Raul Silva, a cyber terrorist for hire, and began forming a plan to get revenge against him. And maybe some petty revenge against Q, who he obviously holds some bitterness for this shitty cyanide capsule. He's smart, flamboyant, capable, another evil mirror for Bond. He's played so goddamn memorably and took the biggest thing Bond had to lose after Vesper. He also won. M dies. Second place. I really like Silva a lot, too. I think he was a much better villain than I gave him credit for on the first watch through. He was very intimidating. I enjoyed Javier Bardem's performance immensely. So, third place. Main Hinch. Patrice. The man can fight. He's quick, and he isn't dumb. But he really only got out with that list because Eve was the best player on his team. And a meeting in Shanghai proves it. 17th place. I gave him 19th place. Because even though he did get out with the list, he was easily followed. And he didn't do very much. I had forgotten about him by the end of the movie. So, 19th place. Bond girl. M. Or, as the box Bond is gifted at the end informs us, Olivia Mansfield. Separate her Brosnan character because she is a different one in this run. Ask the producers and writers. They're on record saying this. So starting with Casino Royale, you get a sense of an old player herself aging out and taking on the mentor role for James. And it quickly becomes a motherly role. She's M. She's the best to do it. And the most important and only stable thing that he had left. Now he just has the job. We get to give her the Bond girl this time. She even got a kiss. A tragic end that I felt more than Tracy's death. Maybe because this was her seventh film. Hell, she was kind of co-protagonist for this film. Fifth place. I liked Am as the Bond girl. I did. That was was a good choice. And you're right. She fits all the criteria. What I don't like is some of the uncharacteristic decisions that she made throughout this movie. That seemed kind of like character assassination. She seemed like she wasn't as smart as she was in the beginning. Maybe because she got old, I guess. I I don't know. So I gave her 11th place because there are some Bond girls, I think, that were a little smarter, did things a little better. One-liner. My favorite line was, last rat standing. 
Most of the one-liners have a softer feel in this movie, done to flirt with Money Penny or almost as dad jokes with comrades. But each one-liner to a bad guy was badass. Someone usually dies. To Severine also stands out to me. What makes you think this was my first time? Waste of good scotch. But a really funny one was on the train. Health and safety, carry on. Still, Last Rat Standing is beyond badass and had a whole backstory and half a movie to set it up. Second place. Last Rat Standing, second place. 100% agree. That was the best line of the whole movie. His best one-liners are looking the bad guy in the eye as he kills them cold-bloodedly. And saying, fuck you, my dick's bigger. Exactly. Locations. Turkey. England. China. Japan. Scotland. I really enjoyed the locations. I think this film was shot well. I enjoyed the cinematography. Everything was very beautiful. This movie was fucking gorgeous. I gave him third place because when they got to Scotland, I was like, I forgot about Scotland. It's fucking magical. It's gorgeous. It's just well shot. They were mostly in Istanbul, but shot all over Turkey. London plays a huge role in the movie for once instead of just a base of ops. Shanghai and Macau in China. Battleship Island for Japan. And Scotland for Bond's home. In the time of the internet and more and more world travel, as people are becoming more aware of these locations, it's great that they find or build unique locations wherever they can and use them together to stitch a unique world. And again, visually, this is the most stunning Bond movie ever. They built that casino, and it looks, by the literal definition of the word, fantastic, jaw-dropping. Using Battleship Island is inspired, and you'd never know when they subbed in Pinewood in English locations. First place. Protracted attempt to kill Bond. I feel like the closest thing to this is Silva's introduction with Bond tied down and then brought to Severine. While Bond is just standing there, it's with a gun to the back of his head. And while it's honestly more of a test, if Bond fails that test, Silva will kill him. Or so he thought. And that's actually very similar to Tomorrow Never Dies attempt with the threat of torture. But this actually was more impactful. 17th place. 15th place. The gunshot scene had high stakes. And yes, Bond knew that Silva would kill him if he tried anything or didn't take the shot. At the very least, tried. And I think it probably took a lot of control just to miss close enough to make it look like he tried. Mission or plot. An out-of-step, physically and emotionally wrecked Bond must find a lost list of agents and who it was given to to stop the leak and prevent further attacks on MI6 from a mysterious cyber terrorist who also seems to be targeting M. Treating Bond like a human who sustains injuries and ages instead of pretending he doesn't when he's 60 was brilliant. The plot was personal and prescient. Very simple, but in a good way. Second place. I like the plot. The plot was very simple. A prevent a revenge plot from an agent who is a, your mirror. Bond was the smartest one in the movie this time, which I really enjoyed. The plot wasn't that convoluted. I gave it a fourth place. Stunts. The stunts are insane. Riding motorcycles through the bazaar and on rooftops. The Digger train stunt sequence was jaw-dropping. The train fight, the fall, and this is the opening sequence. I even appreciate them pretending that Bond doesn't have superior grip strength and was human. The problem with the stunts in this film is, after the opener, there aren't really many big stunts left. Just cool fights and gunfights. Smaller stuff. No flipping cars over bridges or jumping off of anything like Brosnan. Seventh place. I give the stunts fifth place for the very same reason. Like, in the beginning, they were magnificent, but everything else was really tight, just not really big, but really tight. Everything else was just well done, exceptionally well done, just not big, nothing, nothing exciting. Fifth place. The score. The score I gave a fourth place. I really enjoyed the incorporation of all of the music into the background. Even the diegetic music was perfect in this movie. The score in the background, like the Bond theme when there needed to be a Bond theme, ethereal music when the mood, it was very atmospheric. The score almost was a character in and of itself in this film, without being intrusive. The score is pretty good. It's almost always perfect. I don't find it as perfect as the last two films, and a big reason why is the electric guitar that they keep putting in action scenes. It was too much, and it took me out. 
Classic case of the music outpacing the movie. Also, the music should never be louder than the movie in terms of catching my attention. If it was a little more subdued, it would have been perfect, but for me, it was a little too brash 12th place. Movie. Overall, I'm going to give this film 6th place. The films above it are just that much better than it, and as good as this one was. And it was good, don't get me wrong, I, I really enjoyed this film. It's just not better than the ones I have above it, in my opinion. This is the story of Bond facing the inevitable and keeping up the British spirit to move forward. It's about rebirth and maturity, all told through an analogy to the Battle of Trafalgar. It's tragedy on a level we haven't felt in the franchise since Tracy, but will sadly feel again in two movies. We finally get Q. We get Money Penny. We say goodbye to one M, finally on screen, and say hello to another. We set a broken bond against an equal. M is the Bond girl. The entire movie is the 50th anniversary love letter to the franchise, with nods all over paying homage, especially to Dr. No. It's just as smart, after the first act, as the last two films. But honestly, it's way more fun. It brought back that old Bond feeling, and it kept making sure you knew it, too. But where the last movie's one major flaw was the editing, this movie's Achilles heel is the director. A few different choices, and this would have been the best Bond film of all time. And sadly, because of this movie's success, they'll give him way more creative control of the next film. And we'll all see how that disaster will prove my point. <laughs> Second place. And, as they said, Bond will return. And so will we. Until then. I'm Agent Carter. And I'm Agent Sedgwick. Stay spying, y'all. Stay spying, y'all.